thank you for taking the time to participate in this. This is both to Steven and all of you listening out there, guys, gals, and everything in between. As I might have mentioned in the intro, my intention of this I Know Great People series is to share information about what people do versus what we think they do. And I want to bridge the gap between perception and knowledge, as I believe that the more we know about ourselves, the greater the things that we can accomplish. And the general structure of this is somebody that I've met, somebody I know in a certain way, and something that I think that they do in a great way. And there's just different things together with that. And there's a set of questions that I send out that we're going to use that as an outline for this. And then we're actually going to get into it just based off of that. So to start with, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of odd, like asking this question since I know you so well. But mm -hmm. what is the name and the occupation or pastime that will be the subject of this uh, talk? All right, I'm Stephen Thomas Kirshner. For those who don't know, I I currently do investment day trading it's not exactly the same thing that's what i want to specify for the last several years i've been working in restaurants first as a cook and then in front of the house that is as a food runner server and then as a manager most recently i got into my current day trading and investing um career if we want to call it that uh, during the pandemic when my job got shut down i had money free time all this so just decided to take a different direction i live in um hell's kitchen in manhattan new york all right. And the main the main subject of subject matter of this will be the food, right? We'll talk about mm. mostly in the food industry, or do you want to get into more of the other stuff? I think we can I wanted to start by talking about my food service background because I wanted to be a chef for a very long time and I was cooking and I went to culinary school, then I did front of the house. So that's been most that's been pretty much my whole work history up until recently. So I feel it's important to start with that. Then once we get towards the end of it, then that's what I was gonna talk about more in depth about how I got on my current path. Oh. Yeah, or we'll see how it goes. We'll see if we, it's better to do that to the separate one or we focus yeah. particularly on that because you have had rather good success in that and there's a lot of interest I think with that. So uh, I would like to see if we can focus primarily on that and just keep it going as the things go and naturally things come in. It is part of what you do and that's part of this. It's not necessarily focusing on just one thing in itself, but how does somebody get to do one thing, move on to other things? How do they enter these things? Why would they go to something else? What kind of skills transfer across the things? Because it's what people are doing, not necessarily who they actually are. So mm -hmm. I think this would be interesting to kind of see and get to a better, better understanding of how different people do kind of the same things. You know, like are the same person can also do different things. So I think there's some interest in that. And with Steven, with his multiple abilities and interests and things that he does, I think this is a good place to start. And definitely had a lot of conversations with Steven, but this is a new series that we're starting off in. And we're hoping to expand this where we'll get other situations where other people can come on. Steven might be able to host other people while he's doing this and then just grow it out there and get more people participating in this. Yeah. Okay. So anything you want to say else about the start, about the initial part? Well, just to sort of add on to what you said, uh, I, this may come up at other points in the conversation, but I was going to maybe talk a bit about how other interests that we have will tie into our careers. And then, for example, you know, I, it could be a separate conversation, but like with my mother, she and my father, their recent, their last jobs were working with adults with mental disabilities. And they got that job basically through people they met in another field, but it was interesting to them because my brother's special needs. So they found a way to sort of embrace interests that they had and things that they wanted to learn about, but make it into another career. But I think I think it'd be interesting to talk more about some things like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, what's up? <laughs> this is a little insert we're putting in. Steven and I had finished the recording yesterday, and then I thought about this. We're kind of developing this as we're going, and we were talking about this. I was thinking about the actual questions. It's called I Know Great People. So I'm thinking the first time we come on, I think I took this for granted because I've known Steven for so long. We've done so many of these. But um, I think a good question to ask, ask in that first initial question, I've rewarded it a bit, which is, what is your name, the occupation or pastime that is the subject of this questionnaire, and how do we know each other? So he's already talked about the, his name and his the occupation and the pastime. So you know we're talking about him in the food industry. But now I'll just kick it to Steven to let us know his 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 memory, ideas, thoughts on how we actually know each other. So go ahead. Sure. Steven. 
Sure. So it's interesting because I was actually reminded of it the other day. So this was 2014 or 2015. I'm trying to think. So I remember it was before Trump was running the first time. That's when this was happening. So my friend Dina, her sister, wife, as she's known, she was talking <laughs> about doing she was talking about doing a YouTube channel and she wanted other people to join. She and I were going to do it at the time. She lived in the city. She had to move out. Um, her mother, unfortunately, passed away. Longer story. But she used to live near here, and we were talking about doing a YouTube channel together. Anyway, she posted something. I forget which website it was, but she was reaching out to people who were interested. And Silas was one of the people who responded. And we met at Union Square Park one day. It's funny. I brought I brought this up, what I just said, because the other day we were hanging out. She, was, uh, she bought me some beignets for my birthday, and we walked by Union Square Park. And I was like, hey, remember meeting Silas there years ago? She had completely forgotten entirely how she was the one who reached out, and like we met through her. I'm like, yeah, you're you're the reason we met. <laughs> <laughs> Did she forget or we forget? Because I, I'm remembering, I know, I remember that first meeting. I know it was for that. But mm. was it a meetup through, was it through meetup.com or was it like somehow on some, I think it was to a free domain radio meetup or some kind of free domain radio group, just like Stefan Molinero's group? Because I know we all listened to him, right? We That might have been how we met. It might have been on the Facebook page of that somehow. I don't, I'm not quite sure how. Maybe we should call that to the Because she, because I remember she was reaching out to different people, and she was talking yeah. about like working with her friend Jacqueline. I don't know. I don't know if you ever met Jacqueline. Jacqueline moved back to Arizona, um, but she talked about reaching out to people, and you were one of the ones who responded. And she was like, "Oh, that's Silas," and like we waved. And then I know my friend Andrea, who you know, libertarian wife. I met her through you because you two were hanging yeah. out at at the anarcho capitalist meetup group, and I was hanging out with Dina, and then you brought her, and then we hung out at that call coffee shop together so like yeah. i know her through you but then with dina i know you through dina as far as i remember so. yeah no i definitely D D dina's definitely the one that connected us that's the first time we had the meeting but i'm just yeah. not I, <laughs> i'm not quite sure if yeah. it was through I, i'm not quite sure which group it was it might have been a meetup.com.org thing but i'm sure that andrea that was i think that was a meetup went to it was anyway i i know there was some involvement with the stefan molinaire freedom main group either on facebook or through meetup.com there was some kind of organization in there or some kind of reaching out that way because i'm trying to think where i would have actually heard her reaching out but dina dina and uh andrea are probably probably going to be <laughs> very soon on this series to talk about that they do a lot of different things a lot of amazing things and there's probably some great people to have on this um, I'm trying to think, and then of course, since then, since the 2015, I was living in New York City for a couple of years after that, and we stayed in touch. And a lot of different parts of this conversation series of you are what you consume on like the Dying Alive channel. This project will probably be something separate from that, but we'll be doing these things together. So since that one fateful meeting, I'm definitely super glad to have gotten to know Stephen as well as I do, and. He's someone I'm rather confident I'm going to know for the rest of my life. I don't really see reasons <laughs> why yeah. I'm stopping. But yeah, it's it's just been, it's been a great time. Really good to know him. And even from just the conversation that we already had, from talking a lot, we talk a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like some of our friends yeah. actually talked about. Where even from knowing him as much as I had until now these last couple of years, and all the conversations we've had on on the channel and recorded or just together, there was still a lot to actually learn from focusing on a topic and actually talking about that. So super excited for that. And yeah, anything else you want to say about the <laughs> knowing each other? Not not really. I mean, it just yeah, I remember meeting you through that. Then I'm trying to remember if like I added you on Facebook or something, we started talking more directly. I remember hanging out at your apartment. Dina came there as well, the one you lived in in the city. Yeah. Um because Dina used to live, when she lived here briefly, she lived, I want to say, Upper East Side. Like, I used to actually walk to near where she lived, but she moved back to Union. Like I said, she had family issues, so Union, New Jersey, for yeah. those who don't know. And that's – that's. I used to see her at least once a week, but she hasn't been coming into the city as much, especially with COVID. And then, you know, things – she's trying to work on other things. She still works at Yankee Stadium, actually, as a bartender a few days a week. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I never go up there, so I don't – you know. There, there was we actually yeah because we actually went to her apartment we recorded a, a one part of that series because it was supposed to we were talking about actually doing a full on YouTube channel on different things yeah. with different like a sports thing or a different kind of thing what was what was the name of it I'm forgetting the actual name that you had thought of it um, we, we, we'll it'll come up let's let's actually not get yeah. to this this is this is we're talking primarily about this topic with the food yeah. industry I'm sure once we get Dina on that will be something we'll actually talk about a bit more because yeah. Stephen will probably be on when we do that that one with Dina yeah. but uh, yeah that's that's it we definitely went to a couple of Freedom Main uh, radio uh, Freedom Main radio meetup groups because there was yeah. a meetup group New York Freedom Main radio people and that's like philosophy people with that kind of similar interest so that was something that I think we met some people and of course through meeting Andre also met some other people in New York that will probably be on this series 
And yeah, I, I don't know. If we have nothing else to do, we can probably just get back to the rest of it. She, uh, I think, I think Dina went with me to an anarcho-capitalist meetup group, like the group that we used to hang out with in the city. Uh, she doesn't drink, so like she sat there and had water, but she met a few other people that I used to hang out with. And I mean, that group in its heyday, I mean, Michael Malice used to go to that. That was before I went, unfortunately, but um, mm -hmm. a lot of the, a lot of these people since I moved to Texas or New Hampshire or other places. So the group kind yeah. of fizzled out sadly, but I mean that, you know, that's what happens. People move on. So. Yeah. yeah went to that group too, uh, twice. And yeah, I also met some people on there. Still talk to a few of them online. But yeah, we'll see about getting those people on. But, but sure yeah, thing. this is that's that's yeah. that's what this series is about. And if there's nothing else to say, I think we'll get back to the actual yeah. recording because we added this five minutes to <laughs> something that's already. If you listen to this, I think the point is we're going to be is about an hour and forty five minutes left. <laughs> but enjoy that. Take your time. You can get to know us, knowing each more about each other in this conversation and sections. If you go below, there's different kind of things to show the different questions that you can jump back and forth to. You can take your time and listen to them in sections. You can do two times speed, one time speed. Sometimes you talk fast, sometimes you don't. <laughs> get to know us. Thanks a lot. So yeah, that's it. That's all I have. Thank you. Yeah. So let's go with the first so the first section of this. Now we're focusing still primarily on the food service and the food industry. Yes. So what are two or three things that you think people in general would like about what you do, about just the food industry or just your background specific in those? Just let us know some of those things. Well, I, I would even break it up into what, what they would like about front of the house versus back of the house because, I mean, working in a kitchen versus a dining room is very different. I think with the kitchen, it's that you're surrounded by all this great food, which you get to sample and learn how to make. I think there's there's a lot of good camaraderie. They always compare working in a kitchen and working in the military. And you kind of feel that when you work in a kitchen, too. Like, these are your brothers in arms or sisters in arms, depending. And it, it was always fun to go outside after work and, like, reminisce, like, how crazy service was and, you know, have beers over that. Um the third thing, too, I think it's just um, – let me see. I'm trying to think what else I would say that's very positive about food. Um, I think I would say that it's always in demand. Like, you know, I remember my grandfather saying that to me years ago. Like, people always have to eat, so if you know how to cook, you'll always have work. I think there is something to that because, I mean, even with automation and other things, it's like you still need to understand nutrition. You still need to understand flavors, all this. So it's that knowledge, even if it's basic, I think you can always do something with that. And hopefully it can go beyond a basic level as well. And then, yeah. so that, that's for that's for the kitchen. Now, I, I don't know if you have any questions based on what I said. Yeah, with that, um, I think there definitely is something with the team environment, and that's something yeah. that has been noticed, especially right now with the pandemic going on. Yeah. Even with most people in just other jobs, they're very used to, we are social animals, and that has been part of the socializing that most people have. And I noticed it was rather unfortunate that so many people seem to have the number of people that it was, I know it's not majority, but there was a significant uh, percentage of people who seemed to be actually more depressed when they were spending more time at home and more time with their supposed family and relatives. And that's that's a sad state of affairs to be in. That just shows that there's a level of comfort where some people find that release, find that escape from their home environment. And that's that's kind of sad, but yeah. it's, it's sad in one way, but it's also positive in some sense where there could actually be some really positive work environments out there where uh, some people will benefit and thrive off of that personal contact with people as our evolutionary environment has selected for. Like, I know I am kind of odd in that sense where I can still find some connection and some attachment from having these conversations over like uh, Wi-Fi or things like this over the internet. Even though with Steven, I've met him and we lived yeah. a couple of years in New York City. I was a couple of years in New York City and we'd also have some of these conversations. The earlier conversations we had in the conversation series of I, you are what you consume, those were done in person and then we just continued those as uh, we were not in the same location. But that's definitely a true thing. And I think that's something that um, we will see across different fields, the whole team environment and certain things. I've had an experience of playing sports and things like that. I've also had like a post-grad course or worked on other projects where I'm doing some animation and things like that. And you work in different projects and you're working towards a certain goal and you get that achievement and the distribution of labor. That's a positive thing that, um, that that's definitely seen. Now with the educational system, like the, the, the way the the kind of groups that you thought of that that you saw actually in the actual food industry those teams kind of things is it something you expected ahead of time or is that like does it match your expectations that you had before or was it something different Mostly yes, because it's a combination of people who went to culinary school who want to become professional chefs and also people from a lot of the developing nations who just need work because I'll, I'll get into that in the negatives, but it's a very demanding, low paying job. And because of that, 
people who come across the border or on a plane or whatever who don't have as many skills can just be trained to do things, work for very low pay. And yeah, those jobs are lousy compared to other things. But again, compared to their home country, it's it's a serious upgrade. And this, this applies in Europe too. I mean, there's always that joke about if you go to Great Britain, the kitchens, it's all Polish or Eastern European people. You go to um, Spain, it's North African, same thing in Italy. You know, <coughs> this... Um, you know, this has been a, like sort of a dirtier, you know, a harder job that not a lot of people want to do. So um, but I kind of expected that going in. It's either Americans with culinary backgrounds who want to become chefs or it's people from developing nations who just need a job. And then some of them do turn those into careers, which is interesting. I'm always inspired by those stories. Maybe they'll come up in here. But I knew, for example, a guy who was a dishwasher ended up sous chef of, of uh, the restaurant. I knew another guy. Um, he, well, I, I knew of a chef who actually was a dishwasher in one restaurant, went to another restaurant, ended up executive chef down the line. I'm always inspired to see stories like that, like people who come here, don't speak English too well, learn skills, eventually end up running the place. That's always very inspiring to me. Yeah. yeah. Now, with the actual food itself, do you, do you have an experience of people working in places where they don't like the food that's served? You know, some people might, oh, I don't like ice cream, and then... They go work at like Baskin Robbins or Ben and Jerry's. I know there's the, the aspect of if you work at maybe at the pizza place, maybe you're around the smell so much or you get to eat so much while you're on break and things like that, that you kind of lose your taste for it. That's, I think that's something different. But do you think people, are there people who are in fields serving certain cuisine or involved in certain aspects of things that they don't actually like? Or do you find mostly that, oh, if somebody really likes Japanese food, chances are they'll go find a sushi place to work at? What's what's well, your explanation of that? I actually have three, par three parts to that. It, what's funny is that um, I would say pretty much no, almost never, because if you think about it, like most people pick where they want to work because they want to learn that type of cuisine. So they're going to, like if you want to learn higher end French food, you're going to work in a high end French restaurant. I mean, that's just how it is. But what's interesting is that I go through phases and other people do too, where whatever you're cooking or preparing regularly, you get tired of. So I had that joke about when I worked at Bar Balloud, I uh, it featured charcuterie, so I didn't have charcuterie for like two years afterwards. <laughs> when I worked at Netta, I, I haven't had, I've barely had sushi since I left Netta. And I, and I love steak, but I've said to people, if I worked in a steakhouse, like I probably would not eat steak for a while because that's how it is. It's like you can just get tired of that thing. I mean, you love it, but then it's like, okay, you need a break from it to come back to it. And one thing that was interesting, though, is I actually had this Indian friend at Bar Balud. He was um, Brahmin. Brahmin are the highest caste of, uh, in the Hindu religion, for those who don't know. And the thing is, when he became a chef, his grandparents actually wanted to disown him because he was preparing meat, which he's not supposed to be eating. And the yeah. thing is, he himself was vegetarian but he, he wasn't even supposed to prepare any of it. So they, they were really angry with him, but I guess over time they accepted it and they're like, okay, if you're still eating vegetarian, fine. So, but, um, but he said, we're, you know, if you're in the Brahmin caste, you're expected to be strict vegetarian. So well. it's an interesting consideration that they yeah. to take, but as you mentioned in depends on your society, depends on your culture. Some places are more opening to that. And I think with most parents and most people who are interested in their children and their well being, they, they, in general, they will be able to overlook certain things. Like, as you mentioned, yep. it's different if he's actually out there just <laughs> saying, I'm going to, I'm killing the animal myself, actually. And yeah. that's, that's a different thing. I have a separate video on, um, on how it came to be, how cows became to be uh, in general, Considered to be holy in the in the Hindu religion. It's not the Hindu. The Hindu. It is. It is Hindu. Yeah. It is Hinduism. Yeah. So um, I don't. I don't want to get that mixed up. So you, sometimes I feel like an Indian religion, but no, India is the country itself, and there's many different religions. There's actually a significant uh, population of Muslims in India and things like that, uh, and and Buddhists as well. Okay. So uh, so, as, but there's going to also be certain parts in it that are going to probably lead to a higher chance of you actually learning how to actually cook the certain foods, how to learn how to actually get get used to certain foods. Like if you're just a, if you're a waitress, you're not going to learn as much as possibly even if you're just in the back as somebody washing dishes. I don't know, what's, what's, the, what's the level of knowledge or input that you actually gain? Well, it depends on what what you do and where you go, because that, there was actually an article written about this a number of years ago. I'd have to find it for you. But it was interesting because that one of the points they bring up is how a lot of people want to work in these really nice restaurants. But the thing is, if you don't have experience and you go to these places, you're going to be peeling vegetables or doing some very menial task. And the thing is, if you do that, the idea is you're doing that because it's for the potential opportunity to move up to a higher position, which you may or may not get, depending how things go. But I mean, 
in those sorts of situations, there is learning through osmosis. Like you can still look around the kitchen, look at what they're doing, write it down. So you still will learn that way. But this article was interesting because it said how um, this one chef was saying, I would rather have someone who worked in a casual restaurant but actually learned how to cook everything than someone who worked in a high-end restaurant and just peeled potatoes because I can find anyone to do that. But if, if you worked in a local bar but you can, you can cook 100 steaks medium rare perfectly, that's more valuable to me because then you've actually done the practical hands-on stuff and then I can refine and expand on that a bit. Whereas if you went to the, the French Laundry, the place we talked about, all you did was peel potatoes or cut carrots, it's like – I mean, you know, I can hire and train anyone to do that. It's not as valuable for me. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. I think that, that works for that section. Yeah. Um, the, the camaraderie, access to great food. And yeah, how many places How many places have you been at or heard of that actually don't allow the people who work there to get like some free food or some perks or some things like that? What's What's the general take on that? So it it depends on the place. Usually a lot of places will actually take family meal or staff meal, whichever you want to call it. They'll actually take it out of your paycheck because the thing is it's part of the kitchen's budget, but usually what it is is the kitchen will use scraps. So like when I worked at Barbalood, there were beef trimmings, which we would grind up. You can do ground beef. You could do fajitas, tacos, burgers, meat sauce, whatever. Um, other places you can order, they'll let you order food off the menu, but you have to pay for it. You can do it that way. Um, other places, like I, I've heard, I think it was the Charlie Palmer restaurants. They give like the most, like they give like pasta and salad for family meal, like every day. That's it. So it's like I, I think they don't charge you for it, but it's like you basically are just eating that every day. So I think <laughs> that, that it, but in situations like that, what a lot of people do is people will go out and buy their own food because they're just like, I want something else. This is, you know, this isn't worth it. So <laughs> it it depends. But the thing is, it's interesting in the high end restaurants because in the high end restaurants. Uh, Places they'll actually have uh, staff members who just make family meal and they have nicer ingredients. So like my friend worked at restaurant Danielle and um, he actually made croque messieurs in, uh, for a family meal one day, which is really cool because you're going to get really good family meal. But it's like there's someone who just comes in and you have to cook for like 100 people or something. So it's like you have to come in and just do that. That's your job. Whereas in other restaurants, it's usually a side project that you do among your other stuff. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. cool. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. So now let's go to the other side of this. What are two or three things about being in the food industry, about the jobs that you've done, that you think somebody might, in general, might specifically dislike? You you might not have personally disliked them, but you think the, an average person approaching this might not have considered this, but it would be something they dislike. Actually, I was just going to say, did you want me to talk about the positive things of working front of the house, or do you want me just to go oh, to the yeah, kitchen? Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> All right, sure. All right. yeah. So the positive things of the front of the house, what I would say is, Number one, you can make a lot of money in a very short time. Like I remember um, a place I used to work, there were servers making three, 400 a night. I remember when the place opened, the beverage director made 700 bucks a night. And you make you make a lot of money in a short time. I had a friend who worked four days a week there. He made, you know, he made the most money he did as a server. And it's like he still had three days off to do his other stuff. So that's a serious plus. And that's why a lot of people who want to be actors – singers, dancers, whatever. That's why they do this because it's you can make a good amount of money in a short time and then you have the free time to pursue the other stuff. And then when you pursue, you know, when, once you gain enough traction to pursue what you really want to do, then you can focus on that. So like the ideal is that actors want to do auditions and things on their days off. Then if they get a few things going, then they can eventually pursue that full time. But it's like, but that tends to be tough because as you know, that field is very competitive. So that's one. Um, another thing I would say is, the work, working conditions uh, compared to the kitchen, especially a lot better. I mean, you you don't have to sweat. You usually work in air-conditioned environments. Um, you know, it's not as physically demanding. Like, you might have to lift chairs and stuff, but it's not as bad. Um, you, like I say, you tend to work fewer hours. That kind of relates to the first point, though. And then the last, the last thing I would say, and this is sort of compared to the – kitchen i would say the front of the house staff tend to be much nicer and easier to deal with like even when i even when i worked in the kitchen i tended to get along better with front of the house and i remember in one place i worked that sort of created resentment because i'd hang out with the servers they'd be like the kitchen be like oh you're gonna go see your best friends over there but it's just like i i just preferred the front of the house people like i found them to be more polite a little usually a little more educated like you know nicer just i don't know i just, I just found them more pleasant to be around i mean there are exceptions both ways obviously but as a general trend that's what i saw so questions yeah, so on that. That's more there's more turnaround most definitely on the people in the front of the house, so you'd say. Like whereas people in the back of the house, the, the kitchen and things like that are more like I don't say career oriented, but they well, likely I was gonna, I, out for longer. I was gonna yeah, I was gonna elaborate on that because I remember when I was working um 
in the kitchen, one of my friends used to complain about that because she was trying to become an actress. I think she's like a producer of some kind now. And she was saying like, you know, you're lucky to be cooking, doing what you want for a living. This is your career. She's like, I'm just doing this as a job until, you know, what I want to do takes off. And there is a little bit of that resentment between the kitchen and the front of the house, too, because the kitchen will complain that the front of the house comes in, works fewer hours, makes more money, all this. But then the front of the house looks at the kitchen and they usually have issues with kitchen personalities. But also it's like, OK, you guys are doing what you want to do for a living. I'm just doing this as a job until, you know, I can get on to what I want to do. And this will be something interesting that you brought up. It's good to have this as the as a part as the first as one of the yeah. first talks we're having in this series. And I think it's also key that it's a food industry. I know people say, "Oh, the oldest profession is uh, prostitution," but yep. I'm not quite sure. I think the oldest profession might be actually hunting and providing food and then preparing that food for other people, because there was people who were valuable in, I'm sure, the pre the prehistorical villages. This 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 was the best person at getting the resources that we needed to eat. These were the few best people that better at preparing those resources and then divvying them up to the people. And there was a valuation in that in and of itself. And that was before we had monetary like salaries and things like that. So there's other ways to pay somebody. There's other ways to be a professional at something without having some direct paycheck for it. So I think I would argue that that was there. I know the the transaction of I give you access to me intercourse wise and you provide certain resources to me might technically be older, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not quite sure if I, well, they've I wondered the first transactions are slave transactions actually like based on cave paintings. Cause they've wondered that too. Like this tribe defeats this tribe. Okay. I'll give you this meat or this rock or whatever for these people. Like they're wondering based on cave paintings. Cause I mean, again, these are, these are like based on what's, taken off of cave paintings and anthropological sites and archaeological digs. So it's like some of it is guesswork, probably at least to a point as far as I know. And I don't necessarily think that was at a level where um, <laughs> I, I, know, I, know, I know people vary on this. There's, there's, there's ways to be skilled at, at, at the sensual arts, but in general, it's just a biological function. Whereas I would say hunting or cooking, preparing food, having that kind of knowledge takes a certain level of skill and effort, I think, further than just pick something from the ground and eat it. There's, there's a higher level of, I think, human action in, in, <laughs> in selling or in an exchange of your ability to acquire food and prepare food than there is to just participate in the simple biological function of intercourse, which mm -hmm. a lot of other animals can do as well. Yeah. So one, one thing you're, fo you're focusing here that I'm taking some interest in is I'm going to now be seeing, is there a certain dynamic in other fields as well, where there's the creation of the thing, the food itself, getting the food and preparing the food, and then the service, the, the person facing industry of it. Do, are we going to, I'm going to interested, be interested to see how many other fields have that kind of dichotomy where somebody could be in this section that's actually facing the customer, as you said, they're more personable, so it makes sense. They're the ones dealing with the actual people, they're serving the food in that kind of sense. They're the service industry part of the food industry, which, and then there's the other part, the farmers and the people in the kitchen and things like that, when you go that far, who are just making the food and producing the actual goods themselves. Like, which the, 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 the dichotomy or the relationship of those two working together, I think that would be an interesting thing to see. I'm sure some of the people will consider in the front of the front facing, they would say we're more important because if the people don't like coming to this restaurant, even if you make the best food, we're not going to eat it. The people in the back might think, hey, if the food's not good, I don't care. It doesn't matter how amazing the, <laughs> the ambiance is. People won't come to eat if they're getting sick every time they come. So there's that kind of interesting mix. Had, do you know any people that went to both sides? Like you're one of the people that has had a, a lot of interaction with people on both sides. And I think that's more of the personality of the kind of person that you are, just from the fact that we get along this much shows that I'm also the kind of person who doesn't really stick so much in one group. Like I'll kind of cross different lines in yeah. different places where someone's like, why are you talking to those people? I'm like they're just, they're just, it's a person to talk to. It's more information. Yeah, yeah. I want to know that. How yeah. much, how much is that? How much have you seen? If there's any examples of people who maybe started in the front, then went to the back or started in the back and then went to the front. Like, have you had an experience with that? In general, people tend to pick either or. Um, but the thing is, like, I know some of the most successful chefs will work front of the house at some point because they want to learn it. So, like, for the sake of I want to open my own restaurant, I want to see what good service is. So I'm going to work in that position to see what they go through. And then when I open my own place, I'm going to apply what I learned there. Uh, I know I know other people like I my friend, I think I mentioned briefly, he used to work at Alinea. He's a mixologist, bartender. He, he does some. Uh, 
I think he's, I don't know if he's a rep, but like he's, you know, he works pretty prominent in the bartending industry. He used to work in the kitchen too. And like me, he just didn't like it. And he just, he, I guess he came from a restaurant family and he worked in the kitchen, but didn't like it. So he went to front of the house. I'll probably get more into this later in the discussion. But for me, what it was, was it was a combination of deciding I didn't want to cook professionally anymore, but also I was trying to decide what else I wanted to do in the meantime. But the front of the house was a lucrative thing for me because it's okay I can apply things I've learned already and plus a lot of a lot of places they want they like having front of the house people who've worked in kitchens because you see both sides of it so you understand what do kitchens go through what do servers go through but also because I have a culinary degree and uh, people tell me I have good food knowledge again I mean you know that's subjective but the point is it's more valuable to have someone who has both of those experience whereas it's someone who's just like hi I've never worked in a restaurant I want a job I mean you know that's not as valuable versus I went to culinary school I worked in kitchens I've done some front of the house that's more appealing to people because then it's like you know you know how kitchens function and then we'll probably get into this as the conversation goes on too but then you understand certain logistical things so if something is taking a while okay how do you placate guests if you know something is taking a while um you know how do you sort of like work your way around that um you know how do you make things clear in a way so the kitchen's not confused when you put in orders i mean i think there are a lot of things that go into this being on both sides yeah yeah and that's that's a that's a fact of life i think that, that cuts across the board it's, it applies everywhere just and that's part of why I want to do this here is just more knowledge about anything I think makes you more functional to do those great things. Even if you're not actually going to do it yourself, just having an appreciation for what somebody, what somebody in the front, some what somebody who's seating people might have. You just, it, it helps you understand if you have more of an understanding of the kind of effort that the chefs are making to actually get that food out there on time. It, it, I think it, it comes off in how you interact with the people who you're also, you're also dealing with. Like you feel some kind of ownership or some kind of participation or some kind of value that I'm not just passing on this product that's I don't care of, but it's something that's kind of together. It's something that you, I don't know if it's a sense of ownership is an appropriate term to say for this, but just, I think the more you know about things, the more you value them. Even even things you might dislike, the more you know about those things, at least you understand their place in, in reality and existence. And then you can you can attribute the right amount of mental space and interest into that thing and not be so brought down by something that's not that big of a deal or not make a bigger deal out of things that are rather small and ins insignificant. I think that just makes for a better state of life in my personal experience and from what I've observed from other people. Well, I was going to elaborate a little bit on that within the profession of cooking itself. They talk about how a lot of cooks, it's good to either butcher animals or actually go to a farm and see yeah. it done because then you feel a tie to what you're producing. So it's easy to like overcook a steak and throw it in the trash. But if you killed the cow that it came from or you had a role in it, you're going to feel some sort of hurt because you're like, wait a minute, you know, this was a living thing. I, I killed it. I put effort into this and now it's gone. And it's like, you feel something. Whereas if you make a good steak, it comes out, somebody says, that's the best steak I've had. You feel a sense of gratification because you, you were along, you participated in that along all steps of the way versus again, it's like, if it's just some random thing you throw in the trash, it's like, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't think much of it. Eh. And that's something we've talked about before in several yeah. conversations about the food things, uh, like uh, the recent one we just had about the burgers. We talked about the the one um, bell bell hook and bell hook and candle, where they had yeah. the the house bell made book and candle. Oh, what was that? Bell book and candle. Bell book and candle. Uh, hook, I think yeah. you were thinking of bell hooks for a sec. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fortunately, <laughs> Get out of my brain. <laughs> So they have they have the, the a garden on top and then they make house made pickles and we also talked about my my pedanticness or my, my semantics of people saying homemade I'm like you don't live here but the whole yeah. house made thing how inns used to be a thing where it was like literally like they'd get the garden outside and they would bring yeah. the food or you'd be eating the same food that those people would be eating so with that in mind have you seen a difference between working at restaurants where it's the owner is actually somebody that's directly working with the actual restaurant and they're the ones who founded it versus the ones that are owned. I, I know in the food industry, a lot of places, especially in places like New York City, these bigger ones are like conglomerates. So we're not even talking about the, that's one of the franchises where it's just McDonald's and different kinds of places, but the ones where it's like a conglomerate of people who are investing to own a bunch of restaurants versus the ones where it might be, I guess a chef, like you said, with, uh, with, with DB Bistro, we've talked about that, where uh, Barb Alude as well, where he's actually directly involved with the thing. He actually comes by, he's actually working in the kitchen. Have you seen a difference between that kind of uh, environment, that kind of uh, system? 
I, th I think, yeah, I think you really do for sure, because I think what it is is because they're chefs by trade, they're invested in the well-being of the place. And of course, they obviously will put a lot of usually what happens in these situations is they put things that they want on the menu and then the chefs will tweak the menu. Their executive chefs who are appointed will tweak the menu accordingly and add a few things. But the rule is usually you have to keep things that the owner wants. So like at Barbaloo, there's like there's the charcuterie, there's like a steak frites, there's the sausages, there's cocoa ball, there's things like that. But then it's like all the specials and things the chef can pretty much do like has pretty much free reign um you know as far as ordering as long as food costs is under a certain level and it fits the style of the restaurant and you know obviously the feedback is good um the challenge i think when a lot of places cut corners like for example my old boss worked i think i mentioned at tavern on the green like way back when and he said it used to be really good in its heyday because the owner was a chef but then he died and it was either like his wife or daughter someone took it over they cut all these corners because they just saw it as if i do this i'll save money if i do this i'll save money and then it's like the food just became basically mediocre and it's like you're paying for overpriced food just in a nice location and that's when it closed but then it, it, someone bought it up it reopened i don't know how it is now but that's the, that that's how you kind of see that happening whereas when my boss worked there there was a chef actually running it so he was passionate about what was on the menu and he had more creative interesting ideas yeah okay yeah. yeah, and this is when we're not saying this is a hundred percent way different things yeah. happen for the same reasons. Even if you go beyond the whole fact that it's edited for TV and certain things are done in certain ways, especially on reality television, you see things with like the Gordon Ramsay food disasters where he goes to places that are that the chef is like, No, this is my food, I'm cooking it exactly this way. Some of those things are over exaggerated, but I think it, it just makes sense to me that somebody who's more directly invested into it, more aware of the things, would have some um would there be a chance to have a more positive kind of working environment if that makes any sense so that could be yeah. maybe something someone who's looking to get into the food industry could consider while they're trying to get employed or hired in certain places but yeah yeah so anything else that you think you'd like to mention in the whole section that people would like about that field that you might have skipped your mind before we go to the next I, one i think that's about it i mean there might be like little things if i brought that'll come up over time but those are probably i try to think of the main highlights yeah. okay and you mentioned a friend of anya like Alinea, 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 Alinea. I also have a friend I went to high school with that actually was working there for some time, but she was a she was a, I think she was a waitress there. But this is the kind of thing with this series. Like, hopefully, part of what we're hoping to do with this is we start with people that we know and we kind of expand. So now that Stephen and I have had this conversation, we can either separately or together contact our two friends that work there and like we have a conversation with them based on this thing and they can tell us their point of view on working there from that point. And then if they're doing other things as well, then we branch out to the other things those people are doing and then they might know other people and then they have a conversation with other people. And hopefully y'all listening to this will be able to actually get in on that as well. Maybe some of you listening to this now might in the future be part of this whole <laughs> experiment that we're doing and you might be hosting other people as well but it will keep you um will keep you will keep you updated in the on. loop in the yes. loop yeah. thanks for that okay yeah. so on to the next section so list two to three things that somebody may dislike about what you do so this is just things that you might as i mentioned you might like them but you think somebody who's not aware of this or hasn't been in the certain environment who doesn't maybe understand why these things are being done might be put off by this and possibly also things that you think if somebody enters the field they should maybe work past these things because they might get to a point where they understand it's actually for some sort of greater good or it's not a deal breaker or something well the the big thing that comes up for me it's the in food service especially back of the house which we'll start with is the hours you have to work weekends and holidays very long hours 60 70 80 hours a week that's i remember when i applied for my first job i remember my old boss saying to me if you want to work nine to five weekends off holidays off do not become a chef now we can talk about it later in the discussion but my first job was actually at a retirement home which had very easy hours and the thing is that's one of the reasons people work there and stay there because the thing is you work in like let me give you a few examples of the hours i worked when i worked at barbaloot i had to start at seven in the morning if i did the a.m shift i got out maybe like six seven eight at night if i did the p.m shift i started at two i'd get out like midnight or one yeah and then seasonal my second job start anywhere between nine and eleven in the morning i'd get out midnight or one that those were the hours i worked so uh you know the, like it's again weekends and then you have to work weekends of course weekends are the busiest you have to work holidays assuming they're open i mean a lot of places are closed like thanksgiving and christmas day although some places are open thanksgiving too um 
But when I worked at the retirement home, one of the reasons people, because people always ask, like, why did you stay there? Why do people work here? It was the hours. So my boss, he used to be a cook there before he became the chef. He worked, right, get ready for this, 11 to 7, Monday through Thursday, and then Friday, 7 to 3. That's basically a regular person's job. You're never going to see that in any kitchen. And the thing was, he worked there for about a decade and complained all the time. But it's like, but that's why he stayed there, because <laughs> be, because that that's what it is. That's what it was like. He he was the one I think I might have mentioned he would fix up cars and sell them like as a hobby and make money. Um, but, you know, he saw it as like, look, I can get it. You know, I don't have to get up too early. I have to come in at 11. You know, I get out at seven. I can still hang out and stuff. I can see my friends. I can work on cars. I, you know. Friday, you get out at three in the afternoon, so you have the whole afternoon and evening free. And then weekends, you just see your nine to five friends and then just repeat it the next week. So that's why he stayed there for so long, because he came from a restaurant background. And like me, he had worked these crazy hours. And like, I think once you go to those easier hours, it's very hard to go back to that, especially as you get older. It becomes more physically demanding because it's like he was maybe like 43 at the time. It's like like. The, my second job I was telling you about starting from 9 to 11 in the morning, getting out 11, midnight or 1, that was hard for me in my early 20s. I can't imagine being 40 and up and doing that. So that's yeah. what it is. It's people get into these situations where they work in these places where they work these hours and they think like, like okay, the food is kind of boring. It's not what I want to do. But at the same time, okay, I can have a life. I can sleep well. You know. So people have to sort of weigh those cost benefits either way. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine that, and that's what's one thing that I think people might not really understand. They might see a restaurant and be like, oh, the restaurant's open from noon to like dinner, so they might think that's it. But then uh, another another great resource online, you can check a lot of these shows, the documentaries that go into actual food places. There's some going places like in Japan and things like that, where it's just this guy running a Michelin star, like yep. sushi place. But every morning he wakes up at five, goes to the actual market itself, goes to the fishmonger and like picks up the fish and he comes back in and he starts prepping it. Then his his uh, his little staff comes in and then he's working with them. And then that happens. So he pretty much five. And then by the time he's home at midnight, he's back to sleep again. You see the same thing with these people just running small little rotisserie, not, not rotisserie places, but the, the big like restaurant, um, the big like uh barbecue places and all of the different places in America, like they have preparation yep. and planning and things like this. That, that food industry itself is something that, as you mentioned, it's in high demand. It's something that most people have actually uh, patronized. But I think like with many other things in life, it's something that people know very little about. They don't really understand the ins and outs and the challenges that the people involved in the food industry have. And I can imagine not just from knowing Stephen, but just from my also interest in the field is we'll be getting a lot of people in this, in talking about this topic with this, I know great people, hopefully get to like, we know some people who are farmers who are into farming or doing those other things, just different other aspects of it because there's so much there's so much involved in actually just getting that food on your table that I think is people underestimate how crazy it is to have all this access to the food that your average person in the United States of America has versus how it was for most how it still is for most of the world and how it was for the entirety of humanity. Like this I saw somebody post something just like with a spice rack. Thing like hundreds of years ago, a few hundred years ago, people would kill. People, people did kill. <laughs> there was entire right. wars, spice wars, and things like that, for just these spices that they're now just going bad in in most of the pantries of people mm. listening to this. It's it's um it's an interesting kind of thing to have. So, the hours. Uh, how prepared were you for those hour schedules before you actually entered the field? Well, it, it was interesting because it was one of those things where, like, I kind of knew about them. And, like, when I worked at the retirement home, I knew, okay, I wasn't going to wor be working those hours forever. And it was funny because I was talking to a um, a former manager there, and we were talking about when we went from the retirement home to actual restaurants. And we were saying how it was weird because when we worked at the retirement home, like, we used to get out at, like, 7 o'clock at night because old people stopped eating earlier. And, like, you would start break – well, because you would start you would start breaking things down, and then by the time 7 o'clock came, you'd be, like, cleaning up and heading out the door. And we were, we were laughing because there would be some events where you'd have to work uh, – you'd have to stay later, like – um, maybe like eight or nine, but we were saying how it was funny because like back then eight or nine was like late for us. But then like in restaurants, it's like five is when you open, you have a wave at like five wave at seven, eight, like eight, eight thirty is the busiest. Then like a few more people and you'll close like 10 or 11 depending. So it's like, I remember like one day I was getting out at like seven and I was complaining about something. My boss is like, he's like, you don't get it. He's like, you're getting out now. He's like, you were in a restaurant. You'd have one or two more waves of people to feed. And 
it's like I knew what I was getting into, so I couldn't really complain. But what was funny, and we'll get into this next bit with the front of the house, but when I started working front of the house, I went back to working fewer hours. And it was kind of weird to me because I'm like, what do I do with myself now? Because the thing was, I was used to just working all the time. Because when I was at seasonal, I was like, like I say, I mean, I was starting work at the earliest nine. Usually it was like 10 or 11 in the morning, getting out like 11 midnight or one. So it's like I was basically working and sleeping except on my days off. So then like when I went to front of the house and I was working like five, six hour shifts, I'm like, whoa, I have so much free time now because <laughs> I was I just it was like. I had really easy hours and I had really hard hours. And like when I went back to the easier hours, it was like it was almost weird going back. I'm like, whoa, I have all this free time now. I mean, you know, not that I was complaining, but it's just it's funny how like you get used to living that certain way, you know? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. OK, so, yeah, let's get to the front of the house. What are the, some of the yeah. things that you think people would dislike about the front of the house that they may not be aware of? Did you, well, did you want to talk about other things about the kitchen first? Because we mostly just covered the hours. That was the, that was my one point for that. But uh, well, there were other you things. Yeah, more points. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. So, sure. So the other thing with the kitchen is just the general environment. I mean, you work in a very hot kitchen. Um, you know, usually not great ventilation. Um, stressful, obviously. Pay tends to be low. That's what like that's what a lot of that's that is. It's like. You know, people have this idea, like they see the Food Network and think that looks fun. That's what I'm going to be doing. It's like it's not like that at all in the real world. I mean, you know, you can talk about Ramsey show and people being yelled at, but it's also, again, like the hot kitchens, you're sweating profusely, like, you know, you, you're you're pushing yourself hard like all day, like you have to move, run back and forth, you know, so it's it's one of these things, like I said, I mean, it was tiring for me in my early to mid 20s. Like, I don't know how people do this, like 40 and up like they're they're line cooks, 40, 50 who do this. I'm just like, I don't know what, what these people are running on. <laughs> it might be a, something something also where you just get into the habit where things get easier the more that you do it, where it's just almost uh, mm. almost just what's it muscle memory type of thing, because that's how you yeah. do it with some certain people in some sports where they're just so used to doing certain things. And there's also this trope that I'm not quite sure if it's real, but uh, there's this thing that I, I hear it more often here in like Kenya, or you hear it in other places as well, where someone's like, oh, this person has been working for this job, and then they retire, and then they just pass away like soon after, and they just seem to to lose the the vitality of their life because they're they're so used to the used to that the, um, used to the routine of they just wake up, they go to do this, and their body, their, their cycles, everything's kind of keyed into that. And there definitely is an aspect to that, how people become familiar with something. If somebody goes out and they're like, okay, I'm playing football, they, the amount of hours that people practice to play something like American football, it's like now 17 games a season, was well, 16 games a season before. But it's one of the sports where it has the most amount of practice time going to the actual time you're actually physically playing. But you catch those balls, you catch a thousand balls, so during the actual game that you play, that two hours that um, it's about it's about now it's like 15 hours, 15 minute quarters, but the game itself takes two hours, two and a half hours. During the two and two and a half hours, where you're actually performing at your craft, you might get ten balls thrown at you tops if you're like a top receiver. But during that entire week of practice, you've caught a thousand balls or more because you're just used to just the catching motion, catching motion. So there could be something with that where people are just used to just by that point they just. Can almost blindfold or just they just get the food. Their body's just kind of moving through it. The muscles that they that use it because all those motions that you do, you're actually using a certain muscle. Like right now, I'm practicing to use my left hand to draw. It's getting slowly but better. My mind still has the same ideas. I'm still looking at the same paper, still holding the same pencils. But because I haven't used my left, it's not going to be able to make those same motions that my right can just quickly go and do it. So there could yeah. be some aspect of that where somebody's mind, somebody's body is just so used to doing it, where if you actually could figure out the the actual um, muscle memory or the energy being expended for that 50-year-old to do that motion that a new 25-year-old is doing, they might be doing it in a lot more expedient way. And of course, as we also mentioned, there's other things where there's small things that are annoying about the jobs that the people doing them who are older could be used to looking past those things and understanding this. Yeah, that's not worth me actually bothering about because that's something that happens once every like three months, whereas somebody new might be like, is this going to happen for the rest of my life? Like every single yeah. month. So there could be that aspect. Then also, as we've mentioned uh, before, not in this conversation, but we focus a lot on um, we do certain things for other purposes and an older person might have family and kids and they understand that me going through this stressful thing is giving me a lot more per, like a lot more uh, gain by understanding my kids going to 
my kid is safe. My kid has food on the table. My wife is able to stay home and take care of my kid. And that's, that's enriching their life. Whereas if you're just in a situation where you're just going back home, <laughs> like pick on you personally, but you, you made that knowledgeable decision that you'd rather take the commute out and make sure you're living. You don't need that much space because you're focusing on work. And now that you're transitioning and we'll talk about this, I think when we get into other topics, but now you, you, you decided I'm going to get a place that's actually close by. You had mentioned to me that there was a friend that you knew who lived like an hour and a half, two hour commute away to be working in the city. And I was like, does he have family and kids? You're like, no, like, why, why are they doing that? Like, what kind so of, he, what kind of sense he, make? he had just moved to the city. I forget where he was from. He had lived, he had moved around a bit. He was in Saratoga Springs and I forget he had moved back to the city, but he was staying with his sister until he found the next place to live. That's why. But the thing was, you know, it was brutal because I would work the AM shift with him too. So remember we start at seven in the morning. So he'd get on the train at like five or something and come to this place. Me, it's like, a 10, 15 minute walk up the street, basically. And it's like, I just like my thing is just the time you spend, but it's also like if the train gets stopped, if something gets stuck, if there's delays, it's like if, if you take multiple trains to get to your one job and like each one's delayed, you're going to be way late. And then th your boss is not going to care if you're late because it's like you have to be there on time. And that's something that I worried about, too. So. Yeah, that was that was one thing I remember when I was in high school. I was wondering, I eventually saw my high school coach was living and he lived like an hour and a half, <laughs> two hours away. But then as I got older, I realized, it, well, there he can afford to get a full yeah. house. He can afford to get the yard. His wife was also working in a different area. Like it was worthwhile because he had that memory, like, okay, my kid is going to have this kind of environment. And that's just a consideration that we need to have. There's the whole living wage type of idea. Mm. There's, there's other things to consider besides the actual pay. There's the quality of life in there. Certain jobs are done for certain people with certain life considerations. Not every job is supposedly the kind of job that you can raise two like two and a half kids and have a five bedroom home <laughs> like a yard. Yeah. There's other there's cost benefit analyses that you're going to make, there's trade-offs that are going to exist in life. Some things are a young man's game. Like you don't have someone saying, like, oh, I'm 55, I still really like football. So why should all football teams hire me? And so I can no, they just like it's mostly 20 year olds who are playing football and they don't really have too much else to do. That's why they travel around and they have those considerations, and that's the kind of life that they lead. Yeah. Well, I was going to sort of add to that. Like I, when I worked at the retirement home, I had the boss who worked at Tavern on the Green and he actually um, he lived in uh, Kingston and he was commuting to the town is called. Um, well, it's the town is Verbank. It was named Millbrook, but it was like maybe I'm trying to remember if it was like 45 minutes, an hour to get there. And people were asking like, oh, why did you do this? But the thing was, he owned his own home. He had a family and he's like, if I move closer, I'd have to like I'd have to buy a home, which is more expensive in this area or I'd have to rent an apartment. I don't want to do that. So it's like he just accepted, OK, I'm going to have a long commute, you know, but that's yeah. but that's a trade off. And like I said, I think there were some people in the city like this, too. Like I had a. I had he was like a barista slash runner at Felidia who lived in Long Island, but and like it took him a while to get to work, but like he had a house with a yard and everything. But again, same thing, he's married with kids, so it's like he'd rather that than live in a cramped apartment here with them. So it's those are the trade offs you take either way. Yeah. yeah. So anything else on the front of the. So uh, I, I think of something that Thomas Keller said that really stuck with me. He said that. Um, don't think of cooking just as a career, but a lifestyle choice, because again, you know, you sign up for these hours and these holidays, like you're going to miss holidays with your family. If you want to do this for a living, you have to accept that. And the thing is people would grumble about working holidays, but like that gets into, well, okay, it's not fair to make some people work holidays. Some people get out of them. So it's like you, they usually, they usually either cycle them or like certain people work certain holidays and get others off because it's like, you know, it wouldn't be fair to dump the holidays in the same person all the time. And it, I guess some of it is seniority that plays into it as well, but it's like, yeah, usually, like, usually I think the way it worked at my old job was like, there was like Christmas, Thanksgiving and New Year's Eve because the retirement home was open for all those. And I think you had to work at least two of them or something like my boss had it set up a certain way. So it's like, okay, you work two of them. I'll give you the other off. Like that was a deal. So it depends on the place too. other places. If you're super busy, like New Year's Eve gets crazy in places I've worked, that'll probably come up too. Um, it's all hands on deck. Like everyone has to work because it, because it's basically, it's like, if the place has to be decorated, the place is going to be packed. You're going to have a special menu. It's like everyone has to be there, basically. But then it's like the good thing is like a day or two after some places close, other places it's quiet. So then it's like, OK, you can kind of recover the next day. Yeah. 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 This is something that has come up. And I I think this might be a thing also just we mentioned with the team environment where you might seem to be a team and it might seem to be more particular to a certain field due yeah. to familiarity with that. But it seems that there is a, <laughs> a sort of 
I, I seem, I'm saying seem a lot here to be sure that I'm not trying to typecast a group of people, but th there is a level of maybe drug use or things like that oh, in, yeah. Certain, yeah. Certain yeah. Groups yeah. in certain fields. Is is that more of a New York thing or is it like an industry thing? What 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 would you say on this without without naming names or like trying to like put, put anyone out there? Well, no, no, it's definitely an industry thing because I was looking at a chart. Um, drug use by industry. And I think fashion was number one. And I think finance was number two. This was a few years ago. It might be changed out. And then construction was up there too. And then food service was like four or five. So you think about it, like, I mean, pretty much everybody drinks, everyone smokes weed, but then you got a lot of people doing cocaine to try and get through the day. Like some people do heroin, which I kind of don't get because it's like, how do you do the physically demanding work if you're like doped up, you know, cocaine I get because it's a high physically demanding thing, but heroin it's just like i don't know it's like you're just like in a daze i mean i've never done heroin but you know my understanding so um and then people would just experiment um you know after work like molly and you know some people did other stuff too i mean you know i i drank a bit i still do but it's like i didn't i didn't delve into that other stuff i think it's a combination to answer your question of just like the stress the hours i just think it's like that kind of lifestyle of like you know, you're up late, you're out partying with friends. Like, I just think like a certain type of person gravitates towards that and like they get into that lifestyle. Yeah. It could also be an aspect of maybe with a heroin, maybe it's a painkiller, maybe they have an injury yeah. and that's helping them like because heroin's, uh, opium's used. Yeah. Heroin, opium's used. O opiate, opiates opiates in general, I would say. As, as painkillers, yeah. yeah. And they could also be a thing here, as we mentioned, this is something that is evolutionary, this food thing. But I'm wondering, could there be some also some mental effect that could be studied of our bodies itself are primed that when food is presented, something goes in our mind like, okay, get that food, get that food, get that food. But then when you're involved in the food industry, whatever chemical process is, is that's evolved in us, if, if, you, if you had a system, a person, and this is what you see with certain people who have certain, I think, issues, I'm a recovering of obese person, recovering from obesity, it's an ongoing thing, where there's something wrong with your signals of stress comes in or depression, then you overeat, you're eating more than your body needs. But there is a system in that some people will actually have some mental imbalances where it's just they have to eat. Some other animals, like certain fish, they, if you just put food ahead in, in front of them, they'll just keep eating until they die. We understand the certain urges and certain things into us. It goes into reproduction, goes into food, goes into cleanliness. There's other things that are bi biological. So there is a biological aspect in there that you see food, trigger a need to eat, consume food, get that sated, go back to doing other things. Now, if you're involved in the food industry and you're constantly getting that trigger without the satiation of the food and then going back to doing other things, there could be some level of, I don't know if it's stress, but it's, I think this could be some level of overly activating that natural sense of thing that we have in us. And you see a similar thing, like if somebody's in the sex industry, they're probably going to have a certain different relationship to intercourse, even though that titillation, that seeing something, something sexual is supposed to get a natural drive out of us to <laughs> to, to do something sexual and then go back to living our regular life. There could be some aspect in that as well with like the food industry. I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, they've talked about that addictive personalities. There's also the other belief is about like trauma and like people just get so broken down working in the industry, chefs screaming at them and everything. And they just like, that's how they cope with it. That's one thing. Um, as you're sort of getting at two people just wear themselves out working all the time. So it's like they turn to drugs and alcohol to sort of like get through the day. Um, I mean, that's sort of what comes to mind. Like I say, part of it's recreational, just like, oh, it's fun to hang out, do coke in the back after work. Um, you know, at, at, at we used to drink after work all the time. It, it was pretty bad, actually. I remember, like, this one girl used to drink, this one girl used to drink whiskey, and I remember, like, she would be, like, stumbling out of the door each time. Oh, Don't stick on people, that. <laughs> I, I, I might, blur, I might put, put a beep on that one. <laughs> the name and get that out there. This is current year, man. This is the internet. People can track these people down. <laughs> well, well what, what I was going to say is other places I worked, they were stricter on that. Like, Felidia, my last job, like, what it was, the rule was that when you punched out, you had to leave right away. Like, you couldn't even just hang out and talk, because the thing is, there were legal liabilities if like like apparently what happened was people would come in and they would work and then they would either wait to punch out or they'd hang out and they would say i was working and they didn't pay me or there are there were other issues too like if you were to get hurt or something would happen you could be like oh i got hurt on the place and i wasn't working you know they're responsible but that's the whole point it's like 
you know, and I and I, I used to yell at certain staff members where I'd be like, guys, you're done. Just get out and leave. Like, you want to go hang out at the bar across the street, but, like, you can't just hang out and talk for, you know, an hour because then the owners get mad at me and the other manager because it's like, you know, you're not supposed to be hanging out here. Like, it's like what I'm getting at, I guess, is that the industry in certain places used to be more lax. Like, you could hang out and drink after work. That was normal. But, you know, in current year, as we say, that's less acceptable, plus different lawsuits and liabilities. So it's like it's better you just get out of work and just go somewhere else. And then it's like, you know, go be a drunken idiot somewhere else, I guess. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what's, what's the general, another thing I think this might be something that's, that's in there uh, that might maybe dislike and also to like, uh, maybe you can get into this later, but what, what is the, the general understanding on fraternizing between between people in the, in the food industry? Like, is, is, do most places say you can't date within it? Is it more like with the managerial, or you can't date the staff, or or is what's what's in general that you see? And I'm sure it might differ in different places, or is there kind of industry standard that you see? I'm actually glad you brought that up, because I was thinking about mentioning that. Um, what I was going to say is it depends on the place. As you can imagine, it's gotten tougher in recent years with the Me Too thing. Like, um, my last job, what it is, is that staff members of the same level could date, but the thing is they basically had to come to management, like sign a piece of paper saying like, this won't affect work if you break up. It's like, you either have to learn to work together or if you can't, one of you has to leave. Um, managers are not allowed to date staff, of course, because that's fraternizing. Um, I talked in a previous video, I think one place where um, the chef was having an affair with a cook and like basically they both got fired because it was found out. And, you know, it's like and the thing is, too, this place was corporate as well. And they have rules about that. But I guess what happened was he I guess he was trying to get promoted and she was as well. But they ended up getting like kind of I'm not going to say stabbed in the back because it was their own fault. But it was like basically the upper management found that out. And they just fired both of them because they're like, you know, you can't be fraternizing with the employee because it's like. You know, if she gets special treatment, if she gets a promotion or raise, they're going to wonder why, things like that. Um, but then it's like, it, it, even like someone was making the point, like, even if he had an affair with, like, let's say somebody in another department, they wouldn't have minded because it's like you don't really cross paths throughout the day. But if it's someone that's answering you directly, obviously that creates problems. And I think on some level, places have those rules. Um, I, I, there was one place I worked shortly before I was there where, um, the, where a cook and the chef ended up dating. And apparently, I guess, like, one of them left, then the other left, and they kept dating for some time after. Um, but, like, especially now, places are pretty strict about that. Like, you do that, you're going to get fired or at least reprimanded. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, because some people do consider you know, um, maybe I can meet somebody who I can be with at work. But now is how about now across industry? Do you find a situation where like actors tend to date actors or musicians might tend to date musicians? Do you find a lot of people where maybe people in the food industry also seem to relate and get along with date more people in the food industry who might not be working with them, but at maybe at working at another restaurant? I actually see that quite a bit. I've actually seen people who've met in the same restaurants. Like, for example, um, I knew a woman who was a hostess at one place and her boyfriend at the time was executive sous chef. And the thing was, he stayed there, but she left. But like, you know, obviously they stayed together. Um, I've known other people like I'm trying to remember this one this one woman who was studying to become a nurse. I think she is a nurse now. And her boyfriend at the time, I think he's a, he was an opera singer. I don't know if he still is. They actually met at another restaurant within the group. But then when this other place opened, like one of them went to the other place. But like, you know, they stayed together. So you see lots of things like that because, I mean, that's just life. I mean, people fall in, people work together. They develop feelings. I mean, you know, it happens. But um, it's all, but it also, I don't know. I mean, it's funny because like I've noticed with my bartender friends, like they pretty much hang out with all with other bartenders. And then there's yeah. like a few exceptions here and there. Or it's like or they'll hang out with like people who like me who worked in the industry and did other stuff, but like still stay in touch with them. So I think that's a pretty common theme, at least as far as I can tell. Um, yeah, it probably um, is. I think that's probably something if they keep asking that question in this series, that will be something. I mean, also, <laughs> is it's first of the well, series. I, I, I'd be I'd be curious to hear if anyone says differently though. If yeah, there was, you know, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. this is one of the things that I think we're good to take notes down, and as we're developing this, there's going to be certain questions that I think I'll try to make sure to be asking across the board and see and yeah. see what goes on that. And I think the next question is something that will work. I think as this series grows, and um, this question is. Are there any actual occupations, activities, or jobs that you think are kind of the polar opposite of what it is that you've been doing in the food industry? I was trying to think about this. I wasn't 
I, I wasn't sure what I could come up with because, I mean, they, I can think of certain comparisons, like they've compared us to the military, like the whole, I mean, you know, the French kitchen is based off the military system. I mean, even the terms yeah. like chef de party means chief of party, like war party, um, you know, the different ranks, you know, yes, chef, no chef, right away chef, like, you know, it, it's that sort of style. Um, some people have compared it to medicine too, like the idea of like, you know, you're under pressure, fast paced environment, stressful, teamwork, all that. Um, as far as opposite, I mean, I was trying to think, like, what would be opposite? I mean, what I could think most opposite would be, like, maybe just some, like, white-collar, very solitary job. Like, even I mean, even maybe even some of this computer coding, because it's, like, those type of jobs, because it's, like, you're interacting with people, but it's, like, you're mostly kind of in your own world, whereas, like, with a kitchen, like, you have to interact with other people directly, front of the house, same thing. Um, you know, again, obviously, like, you're dealing with numbers on a computer versus physical stuff. I'm not sure what I would say is the opposite. I mean, I can think of things that are really different, but I yeah. I don't know how I would qualify them as opposite, per se. Yeah, um, yeah. we might need to reward the question yeah. there, but I think yeah. that would be something cool to actually do. So now when you have this, there might be somebody else who is in a different field who says the food industry will indicate that what you what they think you do is actually opposite from what they do. And yeah. you might find some things that match up. You might be on you might say, oh, the, the coding. And then somebody who I talk to later, or we talk to later, might, might be a coder and say, oh, I think the food industry would be different. That would be kind of interesting to see. And yeah. I think one thing I was thinking about with the, with the dating, I think that might be a thing of, it also might be tied into how much, Sure, this is ours thing. If you're working in a, that kind of situation, you'd appreciate and understand, oh, I can't see this person at all time. We can't work on certain schedules because you have more of an understanding of the challenges and demands somebody has in their life. But I think there also might be a correlation with how much somebody enjoys what they do versus how much it's just a job. Because I think if you value what you do more than just a paycheck, more than just a means to some other ends, I think somebody else who actually likes that would also be liking other aspects of you as a of your personality or you'd kind of share there'd be some crossover in the values and the things that you I think find positive in where you don't have to convince them why you enjoy doing this if they also enjoy doing it. So that might be something you also find valuable in them where if you're doing it just for a job, you might be like, ah, oh, you actually like this thing and <laughs> I'm just doing this for a job. That might actually put you off from dating somebody in that field. So there could be something to go with that. Well I was gonna sort of add to that. So when I worked um the in the kitchens especially it was sort of hard to date because it's like you work crazy hours so it's like you have to it's hard to meet people outside of the industry because it's like if you meet someone who works nine to five you have to like meet them on like the weekday that you have off and hang out then it's like when are you going to be off next week it's like if you don't have a set schedule it's i don't know we'll figure yeah. it out whereas like if you if you're both nine to five like okay you know you get out at five you know you have weekends off so you can plan accordingly um front of the house it's a little different because you work the late hours but it's like you know you work fewer hours and you can sort of figure it out um someone was telling me a few years ago that chefs have one of the highest divorce rates and like i'm not surprised at all because because you think about it it's like you're never home and then you get stuck in that position of are you loyal to your family or are you loyal to your career and that's sort of the challenge of like you have to decide do i work all the time i'm never home you know i don't see my family or it's like do I have to do something else where I can see my family? And that that's one of the reasons that boss worked when I we worked at the retirement home. That's one of the reasons the boss has worked there because, you know, he and I, we were talking about like pay versus hours, all that. And he said to me, he's like, there's more to consider than pay. He's like, how many restaurants can you get out at seven o'clock at night? He's like, you know, I used to work like get out midnight, one in the morning easily. He's like, now I can actually get out, see my kids when they're still awake and then like put them on the school bus and like come to work, you know, whereas like a restaurant, it's like, you'd be leaving like first thing in the morning and then it's like you'd get home, they'd be asleep for a few hours. So it's like, that's why these chefs also work in institutions because it's like, okay, I can work these hours where I can still see my family have a life, but still apply skills that I've learned. But again, the challenge becomes, do you want to cook institution food? And there's other issues there too. So you have to sort of weigh that, you know, either way. Uh. That's something I, I yeah. right now, uh, we, we have an agreement that we're living in more of a state mutated society yeah. where there's certain yeah. things like fiat currency and, for regulations and no cost benefit yeah. analyses, no people being held accountable for certain uh, wide ranging societal decisions that they make, where we might have some situations where some of these rules are very real. Like the Me Too movement is a very real thing. And it's been, it's been, it's pulled out some people who are, for all intents and purposes, horrific human beings and have been abusing positions of power. But for most of history, most of humanity, especially something like the food industry, it was often home things, often a family thing where people would be working together and that would be their home and they would come yeah. and you'd eat there. And many other fields, going to college, going to other jobs, it used to be a situation where you'd meet somebody that you date. So now you have a situation where a few horrible people 
as in general, most humans are good, then you'll have a few horrible people. They make some kind of mistake of some abuse of power. And then now it's like nobody can actually have a relationship in that place. Whereas if you had a situation where there was more camaraderie, there was more openness with adults willing to make certain relationships and certain decisions, they might find ways to actually have relationships that work together. Maybe if you have a situation where now you meet somebody, you're in, you and the missus are working together at the same job and you're seeing each other at work and you're also having that time at home, then also just the horrific situation coming up with, oh, women have to be in work or you have to have two jobs, you have to live in this place and come up and keep up with this kind of lifestyle. That whole consumerism type of aspect of it can also get to a point where you have the corporates with their uh, with their kind of unnatural and not as conducive to just general humanity, human interactions with their legals and their their um, liabilities and things like that, focusing too much on that rather than the actual quality of life for the actual people, employees and the people working in the industry. There's a divorce from there. And then there's also the aspect of, oh, women shouldn't be at home. You shouldn't have people at home taking care of kids. So that's a whole different environment, situation where that might be devalued. I, I don't know. They could, there could be things in there where I think they could be a more conducive environment that's coming in the future of work-life balance that I think is, is, is off for many people. Well, I think you know where summer vacation started, right? The idea was so the kids are free in the summer yeah. to help with farming. It's and just that how... condition, <laughs> that tradition continued and people just think like that's how it is. But it's like that gets into does it have to be that way or could we restructure this? The other thing I was going to mention, it's a little unrelated, but I was thinking of the hours my dad worked at IBM. He worked um, – Monday through Friday, but it was basically make your own hours. And the way it worked was they're like, as long as you get your work done, you can work whichever eight hours you want. So it was really nice because, you know, he usually worked about nine to five. But if he had um, if he had something to do in the morning, like, you know, he could go into work a bit later, get out later. And then the opposite was true, too. Like if he had something to do like early evening, he could go to work like seven in the morning, get out at three. And then it's like he had, you know, early evening free. So it's kind of cool like that. Like as long as you got the work done, as long as you're there eight hours and you get what, done what you're supposed to, it'd be cool to see more arrangements like that. But I think that also depends on the field because I mean, something like real estate, you make your own hours, but you get out of it. What do you put into it? Like mom was saying the top earner when she did real estate made 250 K a year, but the guy was working like all the time. Like you'd come in the morning, he'd be there at night. He was still there. But like, whereas other people who did it sort of casually, they made a little money here and there, but like their situations were different where they didn't need to work that much or they didn't have the ambition to. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's definitely, it's definitely something to consider. It's just some of these things, the amount of, it's, it's not simply just the amount of effort and time that you put in, but even though yeah. I think dedication and understanding what the field is and being more knowledgeable about that seems to, in most cases, trump talent. Because you can see this, I, I know you don't watch sports that much, <laughs> sports ball, but uh, to me, that's one of the very few industries out there that is still very mer meritocratic, where you can say, oh, I, I'm going to do this arbitrary thing and not going to hire black people. And then one team hires black people, they're going to blow you all out of the water. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be talented. Or if you're just going to be like, oh, I'm not going to hire this person because of this position, we need a black person. We found that black people are the most talented, so I'm going to hire this person. But I know this white athlete has stats, seems to put in, but he's a little smaller. I'm not going to use that person. I'm going to get this taller, just complete physical specimen type of person because he's just physically good. But then that person gets picked up by another coach who understands this person can learn the playbook, puts in the dedication as a team player, and then that person just soars to, soars to success, whereas that person with the physical talent, just when he was playing in college, might have just been completely obliterating people because everyone's at the same level of input effort-wise, where if you study film in college, 100 hours a week versus somebody who's studying 10 hours a week might not make that big of a difference. But if you're in the pros and everybody's the average person is studying 100 a week or the average person is fast enough to physically talented enough to overcome certain mistakes that in uh, the lower levels they wouldn't, those things kind of come. So with that in mind, is there anything that you consider in the food industry to be like something that's like a talent? I know when it comes to something like uh, so being a sommelier, we actually tasting the different things that comes with actual taste buds and things like that. But are there any other things that you consider maybe physical talents? Of course, now with your front of the your front facing, being attractive is a positive thing across all fields. Attractive people just in general earn more than, than, than unattractive people because they are physically visual. And I am saying that as one who I might not be considered that attractive for most people. But it's, that's a reality. But yeah, what 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 do you think are certain maybe gen genetic physical talents versus certain things that you think are key on 
effort-wise on something that somebody learns a skill and works high on the, to actually get onto that. So I was going to say that's one thing that's good about food service, especially the kitchen. It's a very medic uh, meritocratic um industry because the thing is so a chef made the point to me a while back like you could be you know young old rich poor white black whatever if you can get behind the line and produce great food it doesn't matter and the thing is it, people will recognize that and you'll get promoted now to be clear it's not like any other industry it's not devoid of politics and like you know the chef favors this person so they get promoted first like those things do happen but there have also been cases i've seen where someone who really shines they'll get promoted ahead of somebody who started before them because basically what it is is it's this like and there there was actually something in the handbook at my last job saying that seniority doesn't guarantee promotion promotion is based on work ethic attitude all that like if you show you're going to go above and beyond all that that you you can get promoted ahead of someone else it's not just i've been here i've gone through the motions i'm entitled to a promotion that's that's kind of the point again i mean there are personal politics like i've worked in places where like the bosses clearly favor certain people certain people get away with things all that and it's like i mean it's human nature like I, you know i get mad about it but it's like you're going to deal with that in every industry most likely um it's just a question of professionalism and i think where it bothered me a bit in certain places like you know, like my last boss used to stress to me that like you can't show favoritism because, you know, people get away with stuff and also it creates resentment from other people. Like you have to treat everyone fairly or at least give the impression you are because that's the challenge. I mean, we all have biases. We all have preferences, all this. But it's like you have to act like each person you view each person the same. Each person follows the same rules because I worked in another place where the chef like really didn't like certain people, really liked others. And it was like obvious to everyone. And that created all this, but it created all this resentment because it's like this person comes in late, looks the other way. This person two minutes after the schedule, oh, what are you doing? You're supposed to be here on time, you know, stuff like that. And then that also creates issues with the boss and they don't respect the boss as much because it's like, well, this person's your pet. You're going to let them slide, but you just don't like me. So, you know, so it's like those things do happen. I mean, I guess it's like, prescriptive versus descriptive i'm describing what happens ideally that shouldn't but i mean people are people so there's not really a way around that oh. yeah uh. it's true it's i mean this is one saying i have you need to make some merchandise based off of this like everything that's good for the goose is not good for the gander otherwise we'd all be geese there's yeah. good to be certain things you get to find in certain fields depending on where you are at your life at your time where it might be a deal breaker for you. It might be something that attracts somebody for something else. There's some other things where you might be able to push through and then you find it not a big deal. Something maybe you should have left earlier and you find it's actually a lot bigger of a deal than it was. These are the, some of the things about life and I think just learning more about the different things and getting different ideas, asking these questions as well, like encourage you if you're at a job, if you're at a workplace, if you're looking to get into another job, get into another workplace, go out there and ask people. This is the information age and we need to lead into the age of understanding and by doing that, just ask people who are in the field, ask people who have information, there's Reddits and all kinds of things. I just saw there's like a Reddit now of people, the Taliban being followed on Twitter. Uh -huh. it's like, well, they're following what the Taliban is saying, like translating or what they're saying. And so there's, there's all kinds of resources that I think we, we don't use enough of, that I don't use enough of. And part of me doing this series is also just try to make as much of the resources of the people that I personally know, because at a younger age, I was thinking, oh, I'm good to know somebody who does pretty much everything. And, Ostensibly, I think we're close enough to, if you listen to this, you probably are a few people away from somebody who does pretty much anything. But yeah. and my, my, my one point to add on to what I just said is like, I think it comes down to people have to hold themselves to higher standards. Like you can't show favoritism. You can't openly favor people. Like if you were to take my old staff at my last job, I could tell you which ones I think are the best. But the thing is, I can't outwardly show that because again, that creates division and resentment. You have to act like, okay, we're all operating by the same rules. I mean, encourage people if they're doing a good job, punish them if they don't. But like, you, you're supposed to be kind of like, I think of like, you know, the justice statue, like you're supposed to be blind. You're supposed to be treating everyone fairly. If if you're, if you're giving obvious special treatment, it's like, again, I, I lose respect for a boss, but also you do pit people against each other. And a lot of people will lose respect for the boss. Like the boss's pets love that because they get away with stuff, but it's like everybody else is going to be like, no, this is BS. And, you know, it's like, I've just, I've learned like you really don't want to be that person. I mean, that's what I would yeah. say to people. Yeah. Hey, Social politically, we are both anarchists and definitely pro liberty. Yeah. But that doesn't that like because we are anarchists and pro liberty. As much as we care for that, is why we value the rule of law so much. Yeah. Why we value like them to be. You come in and announce that this is what's this is how this is the lay of the land here. This mm -hmm. is what we're doing here. This is what we're trying to achieve, and we'll do it within these parameters. 
I like getting as much of that information ahead of time, and the stronger we actually stick to that and know about it, the better. Does not necessarily mean we have to stick into that, but if we all understand that this is what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish is better, we'll try to do it within these parameters, we come to that agreement and we're working together, you also understand when it's like, okay, now we understand there's some kind of holiday season, we have to work a little longer, we have to cut some corners here. Even when you get to that point where you come to a general agreement that maybe we have to bend the law here or we can't stick to, sit, stick to this strictly, we understand why we're doing it and we understand how we'll do it. And we also understand when <laughs> this situation ends, we'll be able to return to this kind of agreement that we had ahead of time because of the benefits from that agreement. Those, those are the kind of things that I think are a bit lost. And when you have, when you're self-employed, when you're running a company, when you're doing these kind of things, you're going to get to that point to those cost management analyses that are there that I think exist. But going back to sports again, um, that kind of thing that you see, LeBron James goes out and he violates COVID protocol. He gets a whole different deal than if somebody who was like sitting on the bench going out and violating yeah. COVID protocol. You're not going to deal with those people in the same way. No. Now, that might bring resentment within that field and things like that, but I think people watching from the outside can understand the amount of effort and skill and ability and the input that mm-hmm. LeBron James is giving to the team and the league would be a lot higher. Now, in mm-hmm. maybe the perfect world, they would be held to the same exact uh, exact rules. And I would argue that if you actually did hold LeBron to those same kind of rules in the grander scheme of things, I think it would be better for human flourishing. But that's not the world we live in right mm-hmm. now, and there's going to be those considerations Somebody who is the son of the person who runs the company, chances are they're going to get away with a few more things than, than somebody who's not. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm a big proponent of don't hire friends or family. I mean, some people will debate the merits of that, but like the problem is I've seen this pan out where it's like, you know, a son or a nephew or whoever gets hired, then it's like they don't do things that like I remember like one place I worked, like this woman worked there who was basically friends with the boss and like she didn't really do much except walk around and talk to people but got paid. But the thing is, because she was friends with the boss, like you couldn't say anything and the boss wasn't going to fire her. So like there's situations like that. And then it's like either way, it's bad because if you're an employee, again, they resent that person because it's like, OK, if I do that, I'll get fired. But they're friends with the boss so they get paid and they don't get in trouble. But then it's also like if you if you hire that person and you're the boss, you put yourself in that situation of do I reprimand my friend, which could jeopardize our friendship, or do I just let them slide, which creates resentment among other people? Like, I think people have this very, like, idyllic view of, like, oh, a nice family-owned business. I mean, if you can make it work, fine, but if if, if you're not going to hold people to the same standards, it just doesn't work, because then it just comes down to, you know, family loyalty, letting people slide, and it's, you know, that creates more problems down the road. I mean, even recommending friends, like, there are very few people I will recommend. Like, I'll recommend, when I worked in restaurants, I was saying, like, I'll recommend, like, employees that really stood out or like if they're my friend and they're the kind of person that i know on their own they're going to excel and get promoted all that i'll recommend them but i I will never do this oh you're you you know i'm your friend can you give me a recommendation because it's like i don't want to attach myself to someone who's going to crash and burn you know yeah to push back on that first of all with this series i'm not recommending you do business with anybody (laughs) i'm talking to (laughs) don't hire steven based on what he says no i'm kidding (laughs) but it's just to get that information out there so you can know more about it but some pushback on the whole friends and family thing this goes all again to problems occur not because of what x is because of how we define x think about how most people define friends and family and the way most people define friends and family would not fit the way I would define friends and family. For somebody to be a friend or for me to consider them a family, and that's there's a difference between family and relatives. You don't get to pick your relatives. You're born to somebody. They give you up for adoption. That person who you were born to is your relative, technically. But the parents that raise you and nurture you, they would be your family because of that relationship that you have. So now different families have different rules. Like There's a co- common thing when people say blood is thicker than water. But in practice... That's normally, I'm going to let somebody who is my family get away with harming me in ways that I would not allow a friend to do it. I'm like, that seems to be mixed up. Someone's yeah. like, oh, I know this person too well, so I'm going to friend zone them. I'm like, wait, you get along with this person really well, so instead of dating this person, you're going to go sleep with this random person that's kind of hot? Like, why would you do that? Like, why are you investing this time? So I think, and it comes back to the thing, the rule of law. You just set those actual understandings, set those examples, and in my experience, people I do consider family, like the reason I consider Stephen my friend so much is I know that if I say something he considers to be off, to be not fitting to reality, he will point that out and say, hey, are you sure of this? If he's not understanding something that I'm saying, he'll ask. If I don't understand something that he says, I know I can ask him and say, hey, by the way, did you mean to do this? Is this in this way? And he won't take it as an attack. 
So yeah. someone like Steven is part of why we're doing this series, part of why we're starting this. This is something that I'm like, hey, this is something that I want to invest with, with time, because I can trust Steven and I can know we can work towards this thing. And as we were mentioning before, what's the difference between a workplace where the person who runs it and owns it is invested into it versus something that's kind of corporate and not necessarily directly into that? And that's part of the problem with the state is that people don't have that ownership of the things that they're doing. It's very divorced from them. And then they tie that into and they think they can have a familial relationship with the state. A lot of single parents think they can marry the state. A lot of um, a lot of men think they can have enter relationships with and parent children and then pass that on to the state to actually be the father and its provider. And that's an unnatural environment. I think, unfortunately, we have broken down this idea and definition of what friends and family are. And that's part of why I think that whole saying, oh, you don't work with friends and family, when we can probably all think of rather successful families and things like that that have happened to that. And I think this also goes into that whole general negative idea towards nepotism, where it's like some of that nepotism is kind of okay because somebody has actually been trained and raised to actually understand that information more. But then the same people participating in nepotism also take that and just put the kid into the position without preparing for them. So it's about the process, not just the title of the thing, but what exactly is going into, what's the content of it? What's the recipe? What's the ingredients that's going to that actual dish? Because like with the last series we talked to, a burger is a simple thing, two things holding some kind of proteiny thing, but there's so many different ways you can actually make that burger. So family and friends, that's just the burger, but there's so many different ways you can constitute what that family and friends is. The quality of the level of the family and friends is is a is a vast range, I think. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So next question, and this kind of goes into something you mentioned here that I'd like to specific touch on, specifically touch on, is what are the misconceptions people have about your job? And I think a, you being a good person to talk about this is you worked your way up. So I want you to maybe mention a bit and what you learned from how you viewed being in the positions that you had when you were still kind of lower level or working your way up. And then when you got to the managerial level, what are some of the misconceptions you personally had as you went to that point? And do you also think that people from outside the industry might have about working in the industry? Well, one thing that people always that comes up that a lot of people don't realize is that people think that if you work in a high end restaurant, you make good money. But it's actually the opposite. If you work in a higher end restaurant, you make less money. If you work in a casual restaurant, you make more money. And people ask, why is that? And it's it's actually a supply and demand thing, because if you run a place like Danielle or French Laundry or whoever, you have this massive downstairs kitchen where I think they have like 60 prep cooks or something, but all these people want to work there because they want the opportunity to do that so they can eventually rise up and work the line. So, you know, the demand is only so high, but you have all these people willing to work there. So yeah, they can get away with paying people, uh, paying people low, or some people even do unpaid internships, depending. Um, whereas if you're a more casual place, like let's say like a bar that you serve like steaks and burgers, you have to pay people like something because you have to incentivize people to work there. Oh, and the other thing with the high end restaurants is it's also um, because it's a prestigious place. They see it as we're putting your name on your we're putting our name on your resume. Yeah, we're putting our name on your resume. It's setting you up. It's teaching. Well, because Danielle, Danielle Balud in one of his books, uh, Letters to a Young Chef, he basically makes this argument like you can tell it's really self aggrandizing, like, you know, work in the best restaurants. You may not get paid much. You may work long hours, but you will get valuable. And like we're like, wow, that's self aggrandizement. But that but that but that, but, but that's but that's the formula. Whereas, again, if you're a lesser known place, you have to make the case to get people to work there. It's like, okay, I'll pay you more than you work in this cat in this high end place, but it's like it won't look as good on your resume, and you may not learn as interesting food. So again, it goes to what I was saying about you have to weigh all these trade offs in your mind, you know. Yeah, and yeah, that goes to the thing, the, the name. You know, people just hear Harvard, they hear the Ivy yeah. League, they hear the certain places. Oh, it must be great to be there. But no, as you mentioned, some people in the practical nature they would rather hire somebody that's actually done actual practical work at a lower level place than somebody who is, as you mentioned, peeling potatoes at the <laughs> at the, yeah. at the Michelin star restaurant. Yeah. So that just goes into the whole thing with the credentialization. That's across the board. With yeah. my background more being a freelance designer, visual arts, you often get that. People like, ah, oh, but you're, you're going to get some advertising. You're going to get your name out there. We're going to pay you. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> it's, not, it's not how to do it. Or they ask for certain deals and, and the discounts. And this is something that I guess after some time will not be able to say this that much as I improve my left hand. But someone's like, oh, can you give me a discount? Can you work with this? Because like I don't need something to be as top level. Can you just do a little lower work so I can get – then if I ask them, okay, if I do that little lower work, are you okay with me using my offhand, using my left hand to do the drawing? 
if if you or you you do you still want me to use my my top skill of actually achieving the thing and then no but you, you wouldn't you wouldn't accept that in most kind of cases yeah. so that's kind of interesting to see that <laughs> that's that's something that I think another thing that we will see across the board in <laughs> different industries that will show up in different ways of saying okay we'll give you some kind of clout or some kind of name and yeah. again as I mentioned in the past there might have been a time where that actually meant something there was actually something you could guarantee or you could assume that there was certain procedures certain uh, level of prestige and of worth or level of being at a certain position that hasn't necessarily been maintained in the current in current timeline and current year that we're living in right now. Some things have been debased and some things are, are hor horrifically undervalued for, for different, for various, uh, various reasons. Yeah. Well, I, I, was, I was going to say that's why like, it's almost become a joke with me and other people when people say, oh, I worked at this restaurant. My response is always like, what did you do there? Because it's like people will brag like, oh, I worked at per se. And it's like, no, you trailed for a few months and like picked lettuce apart or something <laughs> versus like if you say you work there, then I find out, oh, that person became a sous chef or something. That's a much different story because you actually climbed the ladder and it's, you know, it's very competitive. You have to deal with a lot of other people. Um, you know, again, it's like those, what it, we were talking about turnover earlier, and one of the things in these places is that you actually see the most turnover among the lower level positions, because what it is is people take these jobs because they want the opportunity to move up. And the thing is, not all of them get it, or if they do, it'll be like a ways down the down the road. So people see it as like, do I really want to peel vegetables for two years before I get promoted or whatever? So they'll they'll work for a bit and then they leave unless they get promoted within that time. Whereas with a lot of the, with a lot of the higher up positions, like with Danielle, I think there's like. I think there's like 16 or 18 people on the line. There's like a bunch of stations. There's like, you know, meat, pasta, canapes, garde manger. There's like sous chefs from multiple stations. But the thing is, once you get onto that line, they say a lot of those people stick around because you move around quite a bit among those stations since there's only a few positions. And then people want to say, oh, I worked at Danielle for two, three, five years and I got to work each station. So once they get to that point, they stick around. But a lot of the lower level people will come and go because it's like unless they get promoted like fairly soon, they just see it as not being worth it. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So, with are there, are there any specific things that you saw that you when you were working way up, you thought, oh, the managers are doing this wrong and they're doing this in a bad way, and then you became a manager and realized, oh, they're actually, they actually right to do this, and vice versa. Are there are any other things where, as as a manager, you finally realize, like, oh, these when people are working up, these are things that they can't really understand, or it would be very hard for them to understand that you were. Or, or maybe that you missed, like you're, you're, oh, maybe <laughs> people working up should notice these aspects. What are what are those things that you you've kind of figured out? If, if any? those are actually good questions. So, um, I was thinking to myself, like they, when I started, they used to always say about like certain managers teach you what to do, others teach you what not to do. So I talked about the chef playing <laughs> favorites. That was definitely on the what not to do side. Because with this chef, like. As far as cooking ability, I have nothing negative to say about him. But as far as management, he was lousy. But it was also his first management job, and it was a really high – it was a higher-end, very stressful place. So I kind of wondered, like, down the road, if I worked for him, like, a few, two or three restaurants down the road, would he be better? Like, would he have learned? Hard to say. Um, I think one of the challenges for me was because I got promoted from within both management positions is that if you get promoted from within or without, like, there's – well, how do I put this? If you get promoted from within, there's a challenge because the problem is it's like you're like basically a peer to these workers. Then you have to manage them. And for some people, it's hard to see you as a boss because it's like they're used to just being like your buddy. But then it's like you have to strike that balance of – you don't want to be such a dick right away because I've known people who like that who become managers and they just become like rude and nasty because they see it as like asserting their authority. But then there's other people who still try to be buddy buddy with everyone. And I admit I've fallen more on that side, but I've learned you can't be like that because then when you need stuff to be done, it's not going to get done. Whereas one of the advantages of being promoted or like, well, I guess if you start as a manager, you're hired from the outside, like it's easier in that sense because it's like you come in as a manager. So people always see you as a manager. So it's like if you say do what I tell you, it's like. It's not, oh, come on, we're buddies, let me slide. It's like, no, no, it's like this person was hired to be a manager. So that was one of the challenges that I had, especially being promoted from within, because it's like, again, it's like these people are your friends and now they have to answer to you. And, you know, like people try to get away with stuff. People don't see you the same way. Um, other people respect you. I mean, again, I looking back, I could have been a bit more assertive on certain things. So I admit, like, I made mistakes and I learned things. But that is a challenge because it's like, Again, I mean, I think I would. We'll probably learn more as time goes on in these discussions. But I would think anyone in other fields getting promoted from within probably experiences similar stuff because you know it's the same dynamic. Yeah, this could vary with the people, as as we mentioned before, the difference of definitions. For some people, if 
someone they consider family or a friend asks them to do something, because yeah. of how they define that relationship, they will feel yeah. more need to do it in a better way and do it as fast as possible. But for some people, because they do that, they'll take that for granted and be like, oh, I'm not going to do it. Like, oh, I yeah. can just slack on this. Oh, it's just, it's, it's just. I mean, that's my brother, man. He doesn't care. Like, it like I, I can do. But some people are like, oh, that's my brother. I got, I definitely got to do this for him. So there is yeah. that dichotomy, and I think that's where people need to understand what is the definition that they have in that. And as you mentioned, with different people coming up, someone who's working within the industry might think, worked with you, might see and evaluate, like, be like, hey, this person actually put in the work. I saw them come in at lower level, work their way up through dedication. They know their stuff. And then with their actual appreciation of what it takes to actually be there, they may value you more, whereas somebody else who doesn't really pay attention around might just prefer to have somebody brought in from maybe some other restaurant where they, oh, that's a better restaurant run. And then that person comes in. So I guess these are the different dynamics that people have to kind of kind of work with in, in this situation. Um, I, w- I, was in, I was in kind of an unusual situation too, because when I, I had basically what, three front of the house jobs, but basically what it is is the first one I was like a food runner slash server. Second one, I was a food runner and I became manager. And then, then, then I got laid off. But then the next place, what happened was, I, when I was looking for a job, I had trouble getting another management spot because the thing was I had advanced to management in a short time, which looked good. But at the same time, I didn't have a lot of years under my belt. So people saw that and they're like, wow, it's impressive. You jumped up. But it's like, do we want to take a chance on a newer manager? And that was so I was in sort of a weird spot where, like, on the one hand, I was desirable. On the other hand, it was like, yeah, this is kind of risky. But like, it's a weird it's a weird spot to be in. But what ended up happening was at Felidia, I applied as a server and I was lucky my predecessor quit. And then, you know, my boss was like, do you want the job? So then I got another management job. So, you know, all, all in all, I have about, what, three years of managing under my belt. And one of my predecessors at Netta was telling me that once you have about, like, five years or so you're pretty much good because then it's like okay you've been doing this for a bit we trust you but the challenge is if you have that year or two it's like yeah this is a little risky like you show potential but do we want to take a chance on someone who's this new to managing yeah. Hmm. Yeah. okay now with, with the management as we mentioned with food industry and i'm sure we'll find other industries that will have this dichotomy yeah. of the, the creative class and then the the, the marketing people facing more service aspect of the same industry how many actual chefs like this probably has something to do i'm assuming with the size of the place and things like that other considerations but how many people where you have the head chef is also the main manager or do you have most situations where the manager is kind of somebody completely separate and dealing with the books and the human resource and all that other aspects or like what's what's the dichotomy of that or what's so it actually it actually varies quite a bit because like Netto or my second to last job was a pretty small restaurant. So it was, you had one GM, you had one assistant GM. That was my job. And then you had like for the kitchen, you had an executive chef and a sous chef. And then you had like a few cooks under them. And then basically what it was, was that um, the chef managed the kitchen as far as menu, food costs, all this, the GM and I, we did, we had to do payroll. We had to do server tips. We had to do, um, cash deposit like how much was paid for in cash and that went into the bank um things like that and um well for payroll actually the kitchen that was done by the chef but then for front of the house we did it um and then like in bigger places it's a bit different like i know at danielle there's like executive shoes executive chef there's um chef de cuisine there's like executive sous chef there's like a few junior sous chefs and then if you go to the front of the house it's like gm there's like multiple managers and then like sommeliers whoever at barbalude i think there was like one gm then there was like there were like three assistant managers or something and it was like they kind of split duties and like filled in when the gm was gone um Barbalude also it was executive chef, then there was the executive sous chef, so he was number two, and then there were like one sous chef was like a number three, and the other was kind of like a number four. So it, it depends on the hierarchy, the size of the place, and like experience, responsibilities, you know. Usually, as you can imagine, usually smaller place, smaller hierarchy, like you'll have like chef, sous chef, bigger place, it's like executive chef, and then like multiple sous chefs or something underneath, yeah. Yeah, because in my mind, I was trying to think, like, what would the relationship be with the size of the company, the size of the, of the workforce? Yeah. With people? Is it the tables? Is it? But I'm thinking, no, it, it depends. It depends on the type of food. Like, if somebody's just yeah. doing, like, if somebody's not running a, a hot dogs <laughs> restaurant, you could yeah. have maybe five people be able to serve different kinds of hot dogs to 100 tables, like, like relatively. I'm not, I'm not quoting exactly the number. Yeah. But if somebody's doing some of the more, like, um, elaborate dishes that we've talked about in the addition and Dish series, yeah. You might need to be more of like a like a ten to one ratio. Maybe it's like if you're serving ten people, you need at least one person per ten people to actually get that kind of 
and the ambiance. There's, there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah, it's 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 kind of well, tough. Well, Danielle, I think said at Danielle that the um the ratio of front of the house uh, to seat is actually one to one. Like if you add up managers, servers, sommeliers, bussers, all that. If you add up all of them, it'd be one one of them for each seat in the dining room because the service is way more intimate. Whereas in these more casual places, it'll be like a few servers, and it's like one one server will have like five or six tables, and they just take care of that. Then there's like a few busters. But again, it's it's a different kind of service because in the casual places, it's hi, what would you like? Okay, here. Yeah. Whereas in those places, it's like you know you have the captain taking the order, you have people bringing you stuff and describing it, you have people clearing each plate, you have, you know, it's a more intricate service, so it's it's a much different uh, situation. Okay. Good, yeah, maybe maybe we'll try to get uh, try to get some resources, we'll talk about this off, and then try to get some resources of different positions in different food industry places. I'm sure this place is online, you can find that stuff already, but we might go in and look and consider to include that yeah. as part of the resources of this uh, this entire series and then yeah. maybe now that we have that we'll be able to find different people in those positions and like okay let's talk to somebody who was in this uh, so yeah um okay so uh, anything else with misconceptions we should go to the next one because i think this leads excellent uh, I, I was good i was going to say with misconceptions i mean the things that used to be misconceptions we mostly talked about but people know already like you know people thought it was glamorous like there used to be actually a joke with a friend in culinary school when um people would ask me when you're gonna have your own cooking show and my friend was like never and uh she's <laughs> like she's like there are millions of people in there in this industry how many of their show their own show like 10 or 15 it's like you know i'm not saying it's impossible but they're like don't go to school thinking you're going to be the next big food network star because it's like you know for every for every person like that there's millions of people slaving away in these hot kitchens for nothing so <laughs> yeah there's a good one that, that's yeah, the other curb, curb your enthusiasm curb your expectation to just be more realistic yeah. about what you can yeah. do and achieve in a certain field and not yeah. uh yes set set your set if if that was the thing don't say you're not going to work at it don't completely yeah. uh don't don't completely remove it, but then to sit there and say that is your end goal. Like if that doesn't happen, you're not going to appreciate the things that you're doing to work up to there. I think that can that can handicap some people in certain ways. Because somebody brought this up recently with journalists. Like you know, these people will be like, will say, oh, I want to be a journalist, but it's like journalists are some of the brokest people. Like they do multiple internships, they work for free, and then you know you end up doing behind the scenes stuff, and it's like. If you're one, it's a similar parallel where it's like if you're one of a handful of people and you're really good looking and other things, yeah, you can be a news anchor. But again, you're talking about if you add up all the people who work for these companies, it's a very tiny percentage. So it's it's sort of a similar thing here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that I was, yeah. I didn't really appreciate too much. I bet I, I could have done better of like in the education system. Just coming up, my background graphic design and animation just had a different idea of what I was actually going to achieve. And then towards the end of the graphic design course with Graphic Design 3, where you actually work with people, then at the end of the postgraduate course where you're working with an animation team and you're doing that entire process, you learn more of how the industry is. And from what I've seen with the schooling indoctrination complex, as we've had a conversation on the ivory tower, it's it's unrealistic. They don't really give you a, a good example of how the actual field itself. Now, in their defense, some fields are changing so much and just the technology coming in. But by knowing that, that shows how this calcified system, the schooling indoctrination system has maintained. And it does not necessarily produce the best results in getting people to be actually able to do that. Like, as you mentioned, many people who work their way up will be peeling potatoes for some time, even yeah. though they might have had the schooling. So what is that? Why can't we just find a way to integrate a more conducive and effective educational system, which I think is a good lead into the to the next next part of this, which is like, are there any courses or classes or other forms of learning that helped you do the most, like helped you in the food industry the most? And are there certain things that you wish you would have done that were available to you at that time or that you're seeing being done now that you're like, okay, if you're looking to enter the food industry, don't do this that I did, but do take advantage of these resources and ways of learning to actually enter. Well, it's interesting. I was going to talk a bit about culinary school because, you know, people have talked about Thomas Keller. You know, he's all that he is and he never went to culinary school at all. And but he points out that the Culinary Institute of America was founded, I want to say, 1946, shortly after World War II. And at the time, that was the first school. And then there were like there was like an apprenticeship program and that was it. So even the idea of going to school was very new. It was like you just worked in restaurants. But now in recent years, I mean, you have Pennsylvania culinary, CIA, Johnson and Wales, ICE, you know, French culinary. Like there's so many schools now. Um, 
But the question is, is there really demand for it? And I would argue you learn better working in actual restaurants because, I mean, schools can teach you certain things. I mean, they can teach you what the mother sauces are. They can teach you knife cuts, all this. But there are certain things you can only learn in the real world. Like, in, like school is not a realistic environment. I mean, in school, it's, OK, make this one dish and you have a few hours to do it. In the real world, it's like, you know, you have a list like covering this page and it's like, you know, oh, yeah, you have like three hours to do it. And it's like, OK, make this soup, make this puree, make this tart, make this, you know, cut these vegetables like and you have to figure out how do I get all this done in a short time? Plus, there's other situations like, you know, what do you do when things run out of during service? What do you do if the walk in breaks? How do you deal with uh, staying up to health code? Like there's a lot of stuff that school can't really accurately simulate, I feel like. And that's why it's that whole thing of like there, I guess there are all these there are all these demands and sort of constraints that exist in the real world that are really hard to duplicate in school. But then the whole point becomes like, well, why try to duplicate that school and pay money for it if you can just go work in the real world and experience it? That's sort of my take. I'm not I'm not a big proponent of culinary school. I mean, I went there and like I sort of have this argument with my parents because they're like, oh, you seem so enthusiastic. We help you pay for it and all that. And I'm like, I get that. But I'm saying like, you know, if you can learn a lot of this stuff in the real world and it like you get paid to learn rather than paying to learn. Well, it's a worthwhile process, and it's like a lot of this stuff. I mean, if you, if you work in a few nice restaurants, I mean, kids who live in the city here have the advantage because it's like all you have to do is like go to a nice place, say hi, I want to start, I'll start low, I'll peel potatoes, whatever, and then just learn what the prep cooks do, work your way up, and then it's like you work your way up in one of these kitchens as like a teen, early twenties. It's like you can go anywhere, you know. So, but that's but that's the challenge. Whereas like. I, with the schools, it's like like anything else. I mean, they want your money, so of course they're going to give you all these lofty promises of, you know, oh, come here, you'll do this, oh, you'll make more money, oh, people won't hire you, all this. But that gets into, you know, we talked about it more in Cracks in the Ivory Tower, but that gets also into credential inflation, how many people have culinary degrees now, what value does the degree have, the schools have lowered their standards. And the thing is, too, I mean, it, like I always say, don't think chefs in the industry haven't noticed this. Like, it used to be that to go to the Culinary Institute of America where I went, you had to have, like, five years of restaurant experience minimum and you had to have multiple recommendations. Now they waive that completely. Like you can basically apply and you get in like my old roommate and I used to have a joke where like, if you can breathe, you can get in here. And it's sad, but it, like it's, it started, it started to become like that point, like college in general. And the problem is because of that, the quality of students are less and less. And then certain restaurants in the industry, it used to be they wanted culinary externs out of everybody. Now they're saying, no, we don't want them. And like, there were some places where like, I know some people wanted to go and they actually had to like push to get them to accept like culinary externs again. But that's that's the thing you've created because, you know, you've watered down the standards. You've created so many students. Well, chefs in the industry are going to notice. And it's like, why should I just pick someone with a degree if it doesn't mean as much? You know? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so but you did, you I know did I threw a lot. At, I threw a lot at you there, but let, whatever you want to break down. <laughs> what, what percent what percent of the people I know it's I'm assuming it will be different with the front of the for the front of yeah. the the front. So the front of the business this is front, Fr front, front front of house front, front of, of house, house and the back of house is going to be different. As you mentioned, the front of house is more turnaround people doing other things. So I would assume majority of the front of the house people haven't even been to culinary school. but. Back of the house, like what? What's the percent of the people that you think have been had been to some sort of schooling in some culinary school type of thing or some industry specific school before they actually had their first job? It's hard to say. I mean, I don't know the statistics on that. I would say with front of the house, though, where, where you do see more people with culinary degrees, it's more of like the career front of house people. Like if you go to a high end restaurant, typically the managers have culinary degrees or like the captains at um, when Charlie Palmer's Oriel was open, like the captains there all had culinary degrees because those are like serious career people. Whereas, as I say, a lot of these other places is just a job. So it depends on the type of place, depends uh, where like, you know, if I go to my Irish bar up the street, like I don't think anyone there has a culinary degree who's working in front of the house. But if I go to Danielle, you're going to see the managers, sommeliers, they probably will. So I don't know. I don't have a percentage in mind. It probably depends on the place. But generally, higher end career people, you're going to see degrees. I should point out, too, that the CIA, um, I did the associates. There's also a bachelor's program. I didn't do the bachelor's. What's interesting is, you know, of course, they give you the whole spiel about how and why you should do the bachelor's. But the thing is, chefs in the industry will actually tell you not to do it. Because the thing is, they, they basically said they're like, um, the bachelor's portion of the program focuses more on management, but they're like, you're coming out of school, you're a line cook, you're making like close to minimum wage, you're, you have even more debt. And the thing is, you're not going to be, if you do manage, it's not going to be for years anyway. So it's like, why spend all this money? It's either go back later or like, 
one chef was telling me you can work with certain hotel chains and you can get into management trainee programs where they'll help you pay for it. And then like, okay, we'll pay for your management training uh, to go to school, come back, work for us for so much time. Maybe something like that, it's worth it. But to get it just to have it, it's like, it's kind of pointless. It's just more debt. And like I say, I mean, you're not going to be a manager out of school anyway. So. Uh. All right. So now imagine there was somebody, because you did go to school and there is yeah. still some purpose for something. I think most things that exist might be yeah. dying, but they still have some some purpose or they're still existing based off some good things. So are there any particular things that, or maybe a thing or two that you think you learned at school that you thought or you use in your workplace? You're like, oh, I'm glad I learned this. Or you remembered, oh, this, I learned this in school. And this is, I think, helpful for both institutions themselves or restaurants or people in the food industry who might want to do their own training programs in-house or for the people who are running the schools with well-meaning intentions who you think they might be certain things they might need to focus and highlight on and maybe drop off other things. But these are the things that you think, oh, it was really good that they actually taught this. And you could have found that somewhere else, but you're glad you actually learned it at the at during your schooling uh, process. Well, I was I was thinking especially of my meat and fish classes, which we take early on, because basically the classes were like whirlwind tours. Like you learn how to butcher, but it's like I think each class was like five days. And the thing is, if you've broken down, I mean, you've seen charts of animals. It takes a lot to learn that. I mean, you have to remember. And like I was saying, they should spend like a few days on like beef alone or something. But the thing is, they fly you through it, and I was annoyed because I got out into this industry and in the industry and this horrible chef I worked with was giving me a time because I didn't know how to butcher things. I'm like, I took a five day course where we blew through everything. It's like, I can't remember all that. And then like, you know, of course he gave me a time for it. And what's interesting is that um, when my parents went to the CIA, I guess, to eat or to visit or something, they actually said, like, someone was talking about meat and fish fabrication classes, and they said, oh, our son was saying that they're really too short. And they go, we've been hearing that a lot, actually. So I think, like, people are speaking up because I'm saying it's like, you have to learn all this stuff and like, yeah, you can learn this stuff to pass a class, but you just cram it and you forget. And I'm like, why are you paying all this money for that? Like, you're better off just studying, like you're better off just buying meat and fish and cutting it up yourself and like studying like meat charts online, if that's what you're going to do. Cause it's like, you know, it's like, you're not, you're not really like teaching people. You're just, okay, we're pushing you through this. You officially know the material and then you don't remember. Um, and like certain things like wines was interesting because wines was a three week class and it was a lot of information and not everything. But the thing is, wines class, I felt was a little more valuable because there was like a good tutoring uh, system in place, like where basically people who taught the class were offering to tutor people. And it was like it was a good broad enough overview to sort of like get you into it where it's like, OK, if you want to explore further, you can. But it's like I feel with something like wines, it was kind of the opposite where it was good value because it's like you do learn stuff. You do taste the wines like there were there were a few days where we went to eat in the restaurants. I got to taste the wines with the food and comment right on them. So that was worthwhile. That was a little bit better. But like but even there again, it's still a whirlwind tour because it's like people spend their whole careers just focus on like certain wines. It's like you can only learn so much in three weeks anyway. So, you know, it's tough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, they, I'm uh. I am constantly surprised, mm. not constantly, but I'm, I'm regularly mm. surprised of how, how vast the whole wine industry is. But it, should, yeah. it shouldn't be surprising when you actually just know some things about yeah. it. But yeah, I mean, I mean, a, th a three-week class, it's like how much can you really learn in like the bigger picture of things? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah so we, I mean, with most of these things, the, it's, about, it's about how you can do it. And I think we are heading more towards a world where we're going to mix the whole idea of apprenticeship. The, the schooling industrial and indoctrination complex is an accurate experiment. For most of history, we haven't learned from that. Think about even from babies. They don't just, babies don't really learn necessarily from just hearing what you tell them to do. They see the actual actions that people are actually making. And then from those actions, they realize like the words are just part of the excuses and sounds and noises that people use as a tool to accomplish the actual actions that they actually want to do. There's many things that I think, um, I, I think I think schools in some cases kind of calcify people into doing things in certain ways and then they kind of uh, lose their their ability to actually achieve and be more productive. It, it, it's, it works in that sense as in <laughs> that Prussian system is to develop cogs that follow instructions. And it's not necessarily for creative thinking, creativity, and since you're being in a creative field like I am, with like my background and things like that, most of the great artists, yes, they have learned some practical aspects, but I think pretty much everyone should can learn the basics of drawing perspective and sizes and things like how to measure things out or just have a better understanding of anatomy if you want to draw bodies. But many of the very successful people have their own particular style that's that they break some of these rules, but they understand why they're breaking the rules. So there's a there's a there's a is a method to their to their. I don't want to say madness. Is a method to their expression to their, their purpose of why they're doing certain things in certain ways. 
And that basic way is a good way to approach certain things, but might not be like the key way to do every single thing. Um, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was thinking, I, I think I mentioned him in a previous discussion, but that line cook I used to work with who had a Harvard degree, who was like, you know, credentials, he was like the best, like he had a, a, what, a, ma a bachelor's from Harvard, master's from Columbia, and he had a culinary degree. Terrible cook, though. Like he was like the worst, <laughs> because cause the thing was, he was one of those, like, he, he you know, you're talking about the schooled mentality. I think that's what he was, because people always said, like, this guy is ultra book smart, but has no common sense. And that's what it was. Like, he's good at following orders. He's good at, like, he's good with math. He's good with, like, certain organizational things. But it's like, throw him into a situation, be like, here, figure this out. He won't know what to do unless it's, like, written down for him. So yeah. it's like you get those types of people. Uh, uh. Yeah, capability is not intelligence, is not wisdom. Those are those are very yeah. different things. And there's flexibility. Yeah. And there's, there's many different things that I think get put into one. Yeah. And on to, I think, the most important question of this entire this entire document is, do you like cheese? <laughs> and if oh, yeah. so, which ones? And if no, you're a horrible person. But since I know you're not a horrible person, despite the foie gras thing, as we've mentioned, <laughs> what are your favorite cheeses? So that's a loaded question to me. That's kind of like asking what's my favorite wine because I mean it depends on like like I mean I love like I love Gruyere and Croque Messieurs. I love the brie we were talking about like the um like sort of the cooked brie. That's I like that. Um I like the Dutch Gouda, the 5-year-old uh Gouda from Holland is very nice. Um I like goat cheeses here and there. I keep hoping Casa Lua will open that cheese place by me with the cheese flight tasting. I want to do one of those, and maybe we could do a thing on that. Because um, they had like 10 or ten or 12 cheeses with different condiments each. They even do wine pairings. So I'm thinking when I'm, that looks like it's starting to reopen, so maybe I'll check that out. But like there's so much. Well, it's, it's funny. There's I don't know if you've seen that um, – that thing going around about you may fascinate a woman by giving her a piece of cheese. Uh, Rosie, my pie wife, always posts that. And I was laughing because a few of the women I know like, love cheese. And they said there's some like hormonal chemical thing where it's um, – I'm trying to remember. It's not – it's not an opiate, but there's something in the brain that it triggers, like a sense of sensation. That's why people feel good after eating cheese. So oh, it's really? actually kind of it's actually kind of true. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> we, it, we need to remember for that cheese meme. I put down a note, so we'll put the cheese meme up. But yeah, the cheese, it's it's it's, a, it's an amazing thing. Uh, it, it, most rest, it's it's a very common thing in in. But then, now not every single culture has had cows and cattle and other things. Milk, no. I guess, milk producing animals, milk, milk producing. Uh, what are the, we went to this thing where it's bovine or different kind of things like hooved animals yeah. that produce milk. So some cultures don't have it. Some will have it more. From the, your experience, which uh, we've talked about this in the food series. Which cuisines are more cheese heavy? I think the Japanese cuisine is very low on cheeses, right? But, like, yeah, virtually and, none. It's also part East, of them being East, like lactose intolerant, right? Yeah, East, East Asian has like virtually no cheese as far as I can tell. I mean, there may be like some dish that they took on from somebody else that has cheese, but I mean, I don't remember like at all. I mean, Southeast Asian, East Asian, typically no cheese. I mean, cheese, I typically think – the French, of course, are famous. Italians, uh, Spain to a degree. I, Sp I mean, Spain has a bunch of cheeses, but I, I don't know. I don't associate it with them as much. I guess I'm more used to France and Italy. Switzerland, of course, that's a joke about Swiss cheese when Switzerland is a few hundred. Obviously, the Germans love their cheeses. Munster, Limburg, all that. Um, Scandinavia, they have a bunch as well. Well, the, the Netherlands, they have um, Gouda, and I think they have Brie, and they like they use some of the other cheeses as well. Um yeah, Scandinavian, I'm trying to think. I feel like they have a few. Of course, the British, they have like Stilton and things like that. Uh, cheddar, like they have the Croque Messieurs made with cheddar. Um, trying to think. I'm trying to think about Eastern Europe now. I don't, I don't feel like I see as much over there in terms of cheeses. Like I don't think a lot of – I don't see a lot of like cheese melted on things or anything. Hmm. Yeah, no, cheese, cheese is amazing. I would have seen these places. Definitely that place you mentioned is going to be on the list for Get Back to New York and you're still there. Yeah. I'm with New York again. And so, and we've yeah. seen that thing where they kind of like this thing where they, they have this kind of – metal type of thing where they put cheese on and it's kind of just slides off onto the <laughs> so good but cheese yeah cheese cheese i get like a fondue thing sometimes yeah yeah that, that, well that's that, that's like when i say when people are like what's your favorite type of cuisine i'm like could you narrow it down <laughs> like yeah you know, it's, just, it's, it's, it's it's a very it's broad thing, thing. Cheese, cheese is an amazing yeah. thing and, and good people like cheese i think even if you're allergic yeah. uh it's, it sucks for you but but it, <laughs> I, think, I still like cheese <laughs> okay <laughs> last question of this of this series or last before the last three but what is there anything else about that you'd like to add about yourself related to this actual job, this actual like the food industry, things that like, like we've touched on things like salary benefits, other things. I think one thing I would that I've thought of that I'd like you to mention is your thoughts that we've touched on in previous conversations 
with how mechanization is going to change at least the industry parts that you've been involved in? Because I know it's a big part of the food industry going from farming where we used to have 95% of the population used to be involved in farming. Now you have machines going in and just watching the entire thing, planting the things and the manufacturing processes of that. But how do you think it's going to affect the parts of the food industry that you've been involved in? Just anything else you have in the mind to, to talk about? Well, I, th I think for me, like, because people have asked, like, you know, do you recommend it working in the industry all that, and all that? And I'm sort of I've sort of said, like, I don't regret it because there are a lot of when I got into this, there are a lot of things I didn't know that I know now. Um, my advice to people, though, is like, don't just dive into culinary school thinking, oh, this will be fun. I'm going to be a Food Network star. It's like, go work in some restaurants, go work in a few restaurants, see what you're getting into and ask yourself, is this something I want to be doing years down the road? Like, do I and like, do I love this enough that I'm willing to work these hours, work these holidays, work all this? Because what's interesting is that when I was quitting cooking, I remember talking to the chef I was working for at the time, and I asked him, I was like, if you didn't cook, what else would you do instead? And he's like, I, I don't know. He's like, I've always wanted to do just this. So like, those are the, those are the chefs who stick with us long term. That's typically what it is. Thomas Keller is a similar story. Um, but like a lot of other people, it's like people like me who go into it and like maybe it wasn't what I thought it was or maybe like it's a combination of maybe it wasn't what I thought it was. I'm not who I thought I was. And like, you know, I don't regret it because I learned things along the way and ultimately I ended up on a good path. But uh, I just recommend to people like, again, don't dive into culinary school right away. Do some research, work in the actual industry, see where you're getting into because it's like – like I've seen the same thing happen in medicine where like I knew a guy who actually in culinary school who was actually a nurse and he said he was actually doing it. But he said he just like he got burned out with people dying all the time, like he got attached to his patients and couldn't deal with it. So it's it's one of those things like there has to be some way to show people like what they're really getting into, because I'm wondering with culinary school, if that's part of the scam, they don't want people to know because they want people to go there. Whereas if everyone knows, OK, here's what the industry is actually like, they're going to be hesitant to get into it. And then your their tuition is going to you know plummet. I don't know what yeah, you think of that. That's or, a business yeah. in and of itself. Yeah. Like they're, yeah. they're in the business of getting students to to pay them to to supposedly yeah. uh, impart some industry knowledge to them. And yeah, it's that's it's, it's a tough thing. Is, is there certain things that you've seen that you thought, oh, this person probably shouldn't? Like, I know we talked about this a, a bit on the things people would uh, dislike or like. Is there certain temperaments or certain kind of personalities that you might have seen certain things where you think, okay, these people don't really do too well in this industry, whereas certain people that you think had some features or some characteristics that made them more successful? Well, I think for me what it is is that, like, I found it, I didn't like a lot of the work because I found it to be very repetitive labor. And, I mean, you know me. I have a very active mind. So it's like I get bored with that certain level of repetition. Like, I'm a creature of habit to some degree. Like, I go to certain restaurants and I'll get similar things. But, like, just sitting there cutting, like, a pile of onions to all look the same, like, it puts me to sleep. Like, I'm just mentally – it's like I need more mental stimulation. I mean, I guess – I don't know. Some people, I guess, enjoy that type of work. I've realized I'm not one of them. I don't know. I guess it's sort of like my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, that is liked working with his hands and was good with like mechanics and other stuff, but didn't like to read. Whereas someone with my father, it's the opposite. My dad reads all the time, but like doesn't do as much mechanical stuff. So I don't know if it's like a certain person is just geared towards each of those. It's it's tough to say. And again, I think it comes down to also, just how much do you love cooking? Because for me, I mean, I still enjoy cooking. I mean, I can talk for hours about food. I mean, <laughs> we have. But the point is, the point is, I have other interests too. And for me, it's like because I have other interests, spending 70, 80 hours a week in a kitchen really isn't for me. Whereas people like the old chef I was describing, that's all he wants to do. So for him, it's like, well, you know, you found your vocation. Uh, okay. Uh, now with something like you're talking about with the chopping of the onions, the certain parts that they could be machines soon doing that, where they're testing out like burger flipping machines. And now there's this the situation with people getting back to work. A lot of restaurants are struggling to get certain people back in. Is there certain aspects of the industry that you've been involved in that you think are more likely to be mechanized out like robots? The robots, get the robots in there soon or mechanized or kind of just phased out to the industry. Maybe people are now more familiar or more happy with getting food delivered versus going down and sitting at the restaurant, like what, what certain aspects of the industry do you think technology will really change or actually phase out entirely in, in the near future? Well, as I was saying, I think I talked about this in a previous video, but basically the idea of like, the more the things are automated, like you can already get onions that are cut perfectly eighth by an eighth by an eighth or quarter by quarter by a quarter of an inch. And the idea is like, for me, I actually want to see more of that because then the thing is chefs can actually focus on the creative aspects. Like to me, it would be great if you could get to a point where machines just produce all that stuff and then a chef can walk into a restaurant. And it's just all creation and making sure it's executed. I mean, you know, it, it's that whole 
Luddite fallacy if you're putting people out of work. Yeah, but it would also create jobs in other areas because cost would be much lower. You know, the quality would be the same. It would be consistent. Consistency is a major important thing. And then, and like I say, I think it would be more fun for the chefs themselves because then they don't have to do that tedious work. They can just focus on, oh, I want to design this. Oh, I want to change the sauce a little. Oh, I want a slightly different presentation. Like you could do all that fun stuff and have the tedious, monotonous stuff done. It's like, Thomas Keller says that like he enjoyed doing that work. I mean, maybe he did. I don't know. Like, I, it doesn't really appeal to me. But you know, like, oh, I cut a carrot and I do it better each time. And it's like I get that to a point, but it's like after a certain <laughs> point, it's like you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, I I don't know that there are a lot of people who would be like, oh, I miss the old days when I had to cut everything by hand. Like, I just don't see that happening. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, that could be something that just yeah. different times. And yeah, as as you also mentioned, as I think as I mentioned also. With, it's also the the it's a service industry. It's a, a person face. There's a lot of interaction with the customers. So it also changes with customers, um, customer the way customers feel about the industry, like how they interact with it, the things they demand from them are also changing. I think a lot where with it, with that that would affect it. Like just going out to eat used to be a lot less common. I think then for some time it kind of upgraded, and I think now it's heading out to be less common. And as you mentioned with the mechanization, there's things like those delivery places where hey, you've got to order these meals, and they deliver you everything kind of chopped up and measured out. And then all you do is like uh, put the key, all you do is throw it on the on the implements or put it in the microwave, put it in the oven, put the things together. So there is that aspect. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I say, I don't, I don't, I mean, you know, people will complain about the jobs being eliminated, but again, that goes back to the Luddite fallacy. And my yeah. thing is, my thing is just like, again, I don't, I don't know a lot of people who are going to say like, I miss this labor. I mean, even like, if even you could take all the people I know who love cooking, like if it's like, Hey, you don't have to do this. You can just come in and focus on the creative aspects. I don't imagine a lot of people being upset about that. I mean, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. It frees them up to do other things that are yeah. also productive in that time. You know, maybe somebody can still be interested in it. But now instead of having those really tough and uh, tough hours that you mentioned, most people are in fields that mechanization has reduced the amount of time they need to be spending in that. And that creates for a more positive environment like home, friends, and that kind of environment, which I think is, is a positive thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, I th think that's that's the end of the, the main questions. <laughs> We've gone to the sure. end. I think that, that went pretty well. Uh, yeah. There's some last three questions here that – as this develops, I don't know if this is something where this section might be able to be pushed out as a separate thing, but or we refer to it, but we'll just get into those questions here. The last question, as you'll see, we're not going to be able to really do too much of it, but I'll kind of just explain for uh, y'all listening, you guys, gals, and everyone else in between. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Stephen, for being the first one on this series. This is something that I've had in mind for quite some time, and I'm I'm, I'm I have good I have good I have good hopes and thoughts for this. <laughs> I think this is yeah. I think there's a lot of potential here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the first one of the last three is, do you personally have any questions for me based off of this food topic, the things that we're talking about, things that you, maybe you were thinking that I might find some interest in? Just, do you have any questions for me personally? So the two things I was going to ask are, um, was there anything I said that was really surprising? I mean, there were a few things I saw where you were a little surprised, but I didn't know, was there anything that like really caught you off guard? And then the other thing was, was anything I described about my work experience similar to your work experience, like as far as workplace dynamics or anything? Yeah. Um, well, with, with workplace dynamics, I, I mo mostly like I graduated from uh, <laughs> graduated like undergrad in graphic design. Then I finished my postgrad in Italy for uh, animation and things like that. Then I've just been freelancing, designing, free freelance visual arts. Then I, when I was in New York City, I was working with a friend of mine doing some startups. It didn't actually end up going too well, but we learned. And, <laughs> and so I've never really had the workplace type of environment. That's why for me, this series is also something for me to just learn and get more information. That's why when I was talking about the team thing, I had to go back to like playing playing American football in high school and college. Because yeah. that was the last time I was really in a massive team kind of thing and working towards. Now that I'm getting to this point, we're going to be, I've been working with Steven sort of as a team on this channel and doing these different projects. And we have other ideas of things to go forward. But I think that's less of a thing. So for me, it's kind of interesting seeing different things that we were mentioning. And we've had several conversations about food and other topics. So there are some things that you were mentioning that was like, oh, that's, I remember you saying this. Or of course, it's a new thing, like <laughs> relating with my experience was a common thing was that whole idea of people saying, oh, we're doing this for your own good. Like just, yeah. just being associated with us is going to bring you some higher level of worth. And like, eh, <laughs> there's mm. just there's people, kind of just people across the board in that kind of sense. Um, another thing that I'm, I think is common is this the difference between when you're managing stuff and the expectation that you have 
when I was in school, the expectations I had of the industry versus what I've learned from actually being in there. And I, at least it's one thing I do appreciate from what I've been doing, even though it's not as top level things, is I learned the entire process. Whereas when I was in school, it didn't really have that level of it where some things you weren't prepared for. But I understand the limitations that some people have in the schooling system. But once you're actually working by yourself, you get your marketing out, you get in touch with the actual customers, you go through the entire process, then you have to do the, the contracts and stuff like that. Then you, if there's issues, you're working between them, you're trying to balance your time with it. So when you're doing that kind of self-employment kind of sense, I think there's a lot wider scheme of things where it's kind of tough to do that in the environment that I see with the schooling indoctrination complex. There's certain limitations that you're really not going to be able to achieve that. And there's that whole simple thing of those who can teach, those who can't teach, but I think the accurate thing should be those who can teach. And that's how we've learned. We've learned from watching people who actually can do the things. And I think there's a better way to do that. And that's something that I'm, we've talked about before, but I'm also glad to see that you've also reinforced that whole idea where there's so much to learn from actually doing the thing that you want to do versus being prepared to do the thing that you think you'll be doing <laughs> that you want to do, which I think is what uh, a lot of people do before getting into certain fields. There's an interesting phenomenon too, I don't know what to call it, but basically where you'll learn certain things in certain places and then you'll apply them in other places. You'll be like, where did I learn that? And be like, oh, I learned that here. And like, and that even applies to, I mean, there, you know, there are bosses who I've despised who I've learned things from. So it's <laughs> like, I, I try, I try to, I try to separate the personality from the skills. Cause it's like, there are things that like, I can criticize certain bosses, but they'll do things well. And then like, I'll do that in a later place. But like, where did I get that? Oh yeah, it was from this guy. But it's like, I think, you know, there has to be emphasis on the skills rather than the personality. Cause it's like, I think we're guilty of falling into, I don't like this person. I'm going to write them off. And I admit I've, I've fallen into that too. But at some point you realize like you, whether what to do or what not to do, you can learn that from pretty much anyone you work with on some level. Yeah. 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 I was re-listening to Orson Scott Card's uh, Ender's, Ender's, Ender's Game. It's a great series. I've read all the great, I think the, the next part of it, he's one of the most prolific writers I've ever seen. And I'm trying to get more into like writing and creative. I do arts, visuals and stuff like that, but I've also been involved in like <laughs> writing my own stories and things like that. But the amount of content this guy puts out. Well, anyway, there's, there's a part where it's kind of a spoiler. I guess I'm not going to spoil it, but you should definitely check out the book. But there's a, mm -hmm. there's a character who says that the, your, your enemy, this is a competitive kind of environment where he says your enemy is the one who teaches, who t who's the, only, the only teacher is your enemy. And you can't tell tell your enemy when the game is over, when he's won, or when he's lost. And there's that whole aspect of actually just being in the actual fray of the actual events. And the enemy doesn't have to be a, another being, but it's just the challenges that you face when you're trying to achieve something. Very few things to start taking for granted. And I think part of what I'd like to do with the series, and I think it's, it's working in a pretty good way, is just being more realistic and understanding different challenges that people have. There's some challenges you had that somebody else might consider to not be an issue. There's some things that were not an issue to you that some people um, would consider to be an issue. But I definitely think one big issue across the board is there's a lot of secrecy or a lot of limitations on the knowledge of certain fields that are available for people to know that are not industry secrets, that are not yeah. things that I don't think there's any real benefit to hide the truth and reality of the way no. certain things are. But I don't understand why people still do that. It's, it's an odd situation to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the next question is: Do you have any questions um, for to anyone else that may answer this questionnaire? Like, any other questions that? Um, yeah. Any any other questions for people who would who would want to be participating in this, or people who are watching this, or maybe the people who are listening to the things that you said? Do you have any other questions for them that you think okay, maybe things that you'd want to that you think they might be interested in, or reasons they should participate in this? Just general things about this. Well, I'd ask questions like, how did your perception of food service change or did it change at all after what I asked? Um, would you want to work in this industry based on what I said or would you want to avoid it completely? Um, I'm trying to think what else. I, again, I had similar stuff to what I asked you about, like, was there anything in here that you felt was relevant to your own experience? Because, again, my background, aside from my recent investing, all I've done is restaurants, so I can't really – compare i can't say oh if you work in finance it's like this if you work in real estate it's like this like i don't have that experience whereas other people who jumped around a little bit they can tell you oh this happens everywhere you know workplace dynamics are the same so i'd be curious to delve into some of those issues as i mentioned yeah. okay 
And the last question, the last three is, would you like to take a random question, a random or requested question? And that's why we've done this part as we build this up, the questions that we asked before in the second question of the last three were for the people out there. So if you have questions for Stephen based off of this topic in particular, you can ask those questions. We'll find a place for you to submit those questions. And then we might bring him on. De I'll definitely have him on to talk about the financial industry and his other projects that we're working on. There's other things that we do. This is not going to be focused primarily on occupations, but we'll it will be primarily in occupations, let me say that, but it will be other things, other aspects of, that people do. So there's things that we have personal interest that are more like a hobby level or just things, fields and industries or <laughs> ways of thinking that we're interested in. I could, could probably imagine we could do something like anarcho-capitalism or li the, the liberty, I idea of liberty in the world. Like there's, there's things that we can do in those fields that are more focused on that, that we'll develop. But if you have specific industries for Stephen based on the food and, sorry, specific questions or Stephen, based on his experience in the food industry, like if it gets to a point, once we have a database, Stephen will be able to pick a random question or a requested question. And that requested question, I'd pick one of the questions somebody had specifically for him. So on the next time he's back on, if the specific questions that have been asked about this, that might be one of the things that we bring up in that one. Or we might figure out if there's enough questions through an entirely separate one where we don't go through the whole rigmarole of <laughs> all the questions, since we can just refer you back to this. But we just said, okay, now we're answering some questions that people submitted based off of this. Yeah, yeah some, some way to streamline that I think would be good because it's like people, a few people have told me they're like, I like your videos, but like I've been busy. I don't have time for them. But if there's somewhere where it could just be submit your question here, we can address that, you know, yeah. wherever. Uh, so uh. Those will be things that, that come. Mm -hmm. And so far, I mean, <laughs> I'm really glad. I'm not surprised that this went well. We've had a lot of practice yeah. speaking with Stephen, but I think this would go well with a lot of people. And Definitely. I, I think this yeah. would be a good series. But yeah. Sure. Cool. Um, we've had a lot of series. If you and if you're interested at all, if this is the first time you're hearing Stephen talk about food, he's he's he was being very humble, and um, I, I encourage him to be like, <laughs> more like boastful and, or prideful <laughs> or aware of of how confident and how uh, knowledgeable he is about the food industry. If you've in, if you've liked his talking about that, and you haven't heard him before, and that we have several topics, as dishing for dish series that is specifically focusing on actual just talking about food and the UR what we consume, which is a larger series, just food related things. And we're talking about different things and food. Like we had an entire one just talking about the French laundry. We had a different one talking about industrialization of the food industry and things like that. So there's those different topics and we'll be getting that. And with this series, Stephen will be one of the primary hosts on with this I Know Great People. Some of them will just be Stephen hosting by himself. Some of them will be hosting together, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get more of that content out with this specific I Know Great People. Anything else you want to say to the peoples out there based off of this? No, I mean, you know, I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to ask me whatever. I'd be curious to see what some of you have to say. All right. So thank you all very much. We'll figure out the entire structure of this. I think for these initial round, we'll figure out how to get to the, the how to get to the defining of no in order to qualify to be on this. We're, sure. we're talking that out. I, I, but to begin with, I'd like to keep, we're going to keep it between the people that we've actually met in person. And then we'll, we'll, as it grows, we'll kind of get to build up the structure of this. But uh, I'm looking forward to this. Sure Thanks thank again, me. Stephen, for doing it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. Goodbye. Bye-bye.